You okay, Sarah? You're on mute. <laughs> Okay, all right, we're good to go. Thank you all uh, members, uh, officers, uh, for your attendance this evening at Policy and Resources. Uh, we have uh, 18 items on our agenda uh, for this evening uh, to go through. Uh, just a reminder that this is a remote meeting of the council. Uh, we are streaming this live onto YouTube for the public and stakeholders to watch. Uh, we are not in control uh, of the uh, the comment section uh, live on YouTube. Uh, so uh, apologies in advance if there is anything untoward on there, the council is not in control of that, uh, but we ask people to exercise discretion if they are leaving comments on the live feed. Uh, as this is a remote meeting, I will ask each uh, councillor who is sitting on the committee uh, how they are voting. I will also use my discretion tonight uh, on several items. We do have a lot to get through. Uh, I understand that there are ward specific items on the agenda and of course I will uh, make allowances tonight for ward members who wish to speak to come in to speak, uh, but not on every item. So if you are not uh, a group leader uh, or a deputy group leader or a ward councillor, uh, your chances are pretty slim of getting in on every item. So uh, please bear with me. I am going to try and be as fair as I can uh, to the members who have indicated uh, both today and previously to democratic services that there are items that they do want to uh, speak on and I will try to accommodate everybody uh, as quickly as I can but I'm sure I am not the only councillor who does not want to be here at two o'clock in the morning uh, but if that is necessary then we will have to do it um, as I said before it's uh, helpful for the smooth running of the meeting uh, if we can keep ourselves on mute uh, unless uh, you wish to indicate because of the number of members and officers who are on the screen at this moment in time, uh, it is not possible for me to see everybody uh, who perhaps is waving at me or indicating to speak. Uh, I can ask you, therefore, if you would use the raise your hand function uh, on the uh, Zoom calls if you do uh, wish to come in. I will do a cursory round robin of the of the members to make sure that anybody who uh, hasn't spoken is given that opportunity. But uh, it's not possible for me to see everybody on the screen, so uh, I would be grateful if we could make use uh, of that function. Uh, turning to uh, the agenda uh, for uh, this evening, um, the first agenda item is apologies for absence. Uh, we'd, I'm going to hand over to Sarah, who I think has something to inform the committee of. Uh, yeah, we have no apologies for absence as such, but we have Councillor Buckley um, replacing Councillor Blake as a member on the committee. Okay, so that is a, a replacement as a, a sitting member on uh, the committee uh, for this evening's uh, meeting following the resignation of Councillor Blake from the Conservative group. We, of course, do have uh, a substitution in Democratic Services tonight with Sarah uh, taking the place uh, of Karina uh, as well. So thank you for that. Minutes of our previous meeting that were held on the 25th of June is our second agenda item. Uh, are there any matters arising from members of the committee uh, in relation to those minutes? I'm doing a flick through. Councillor McGarren? Sorry, the only one is, um, and I might be mistaken here, so forgive me if I am. Uh, there was an item right at the end of the minutes about um, possibly taking on uh, one of the traveller sites that Essex seem to be willing to let go. I gather they've ha had a bit of a reverse ferret on the project and they're not doing that anymore, but forgive me if I'm, if I'm, I, uh, if I'm mistaken. Okay. I, I've seen uh, something to that effect as well, but perhaps we'll pick that up in the work programme uh, rather, uh, rather than necessarily here in the minutes. Uh, in which case, if there are no uh, further uh, matters arising from the minutes, I'll take uh, a vote on whether they are a true record. Can I ask the committee members uh, to unmute themselves so that we can record your votes? And I'll start with Councillor Smith. In favour. Councillor Brown. In favour. Councillor McGarren. In favour. Councillor Baggett. In favour. Councillor Sullivan. Agreed. Councillor Buckley. Staying not present at the previous meeting. 
Thank you. And I will vote in favour. So thank you, members. Uh, that is carried. Uh, agenda item three uh, is declarations of interest. Uh, does any member of the committee uh, or any member wishing to participate in the meeting uh, have a declaration that they wish to share? Councillor Buckley. Just to say I've been lobbied in, in respect of uh, item 10, Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think just because it's short, we probably all have been, or certainly most of us have been. Yeah, I was going to say if there's anyone on the contrary to uh, agenda item ten having been lobbied, speak now for whoever holds a piece. Uh, otherwise, we will record that as a uh, as a standard for all uh, councillors uh, who are on the call. Okay, thank you. Uh, that uh, there are no further uh, declarations of interest. Uh, we come to uh, agenda item four, which is the appointment of trustees to the Great Burstead Exhibition Foundation. Uh, there is a report uh, that you will uh, have seen, and I uh, just getting this uh, in front of me here. Uh, I have since the publication of the report, uh, I have spoken uh, to uh, Councillor Blake, uh, who has uh, determined that he uh, no longer wishes. Uh, to uh, be considered for this role. So as a consequence, uh, I am inviting uh, from uh, the uh, floor uh, any uh, other members who may wish to put themselves uh, forward uh, for this uh, item. Otherwise, I will uh, make a nomination, or indeed I will be making a nomination uh, alongside this as well. Councillor Baggett. I nominate you. Councillor Moore. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Moore is nominated. Uh, I nominate Councillor David Dads uh, for the position uh, as well, uh, in which case uh, we will go to a vote. So we have uh, Council, if I can ask all uh, sitting members of the committee to unmute themselves, uh, unless there is any uh, member wishing to speak on the Sorry, uh, Gabby. Item. Do you need seconders or not? Sorry. Uh, not, not, for, not for this stage, no. no. We're fine for that at the moment. Um, can I ask, uh, I'm not seeing anybody indicating either uh, waving at me or on the uh, raising of the hand, uh, so uh, in which case I'm going to uh, put Councillor Moore to uh, the vote. Uh, Councillor Baggett? Four. Councillor Sullivan? Four. Councillor Buckley? Four. I vote against. Councillor Smith? Against. Councillor Brown? Against. Councillor McGurran. Against. Councillor Moore's vote is lost. The nomination on the floor now is for Councillor Dads. Uh, Councillor Smith, how do you vote? Oh. Councillor Brown? Four. Oh. Councillor McGurran? Four. Oh. Councillor Baggett? Abstain. Councillor Sullivan? Abstain. Councillor Buckley? Abstain. And I vote in favour. Uh, thank you, members. So the motion, uh, as amended, uh, for Councillor Dads to be appointed as the representative of, uh, as a trustee to the Great Burstead Exhibition Foundation, is carried. Uh, thank you. Uh, next, agenda item five is the uh, Association of South Essex Local Authorities. Uh, there is a report in front of us as members uh, to uh, consider. Uh, I am going to ask. Uh, there is a presentation that I would like to make uh, as leader of the council, uh, and then. Uh, I will open it up to questions uh, from the committee. So uh, can I ask uh, Democratic to share, or thank you, uh, Councillor, uh, Councillor, <laughs> Mr. Birkinshaw, thank you. Um, um, okay, so the Association of South Essex uh, Local Authorities, uh, as you know, is made up uh, of uh, six district and unitary councils that stretches across the South Essex uh, estuary. Uh, Basildon, Brentwood, Castle Point, Rutherford, Southend uh, and Thurrock. An MOU was signed in 2018 uh, to talk about how we were going to come together uh, and to work together uh, to deliver uh, a joint place-based vision for the future growth of our area. Uh, over the course of the last uh, two years, uh, Acela uh, leaders and officers have been working together successfully. Uh, we have attracted in that time 4.5 million pounds of new investment from the government to build the local full fiber network. 
Uh, we are in the process of creating a powerful economic plan for the region. We've been working collaboratively with Homes England on our infrastructure requirements to support housing. Uh, we know, do we not, that the number one priority for residents is infrastructure. They don't just want houses built, they want the infrastructure to come with it. And that is exactly what we have been talking uh, to Homes England uh, about. And we've been identifying uh, key strategic priorities that all uh, South Essex authorities want to unite behind. And they are the five that are on screen there in the uh, blue box uh, on that screen. Um, and through uh, the joint working that we've done, it has become clear that South Essex has got huge potential to increase the prosperity for all of our residents. But in order for that to happen, there needs to be a bold and um, an ambitious plan that is underpinned by long-term investment. The powers uh, transferred from Whitehall uh, to our region so that the decisions that affect South Essex are made and taken locally in South Essex. Uh, we know, and we know this from our own borough, let alone our own region, that South Essex is made up of different communities, but it works as a functioning economic area uh, and it offers uh, this kind of scale in South Essex to be able to attract major investors from government and the private sector. And that scale is going to be even more important as we bring together our response to COVID-19 uh, as an example. And if we move on to the next slide, um, then we will see that every economic measure shows that South Essex is lagging behind uh, all other comparator areas, including average weekly wage in the area, economic output and levels of skill attainment. Uh, our transport uh, system, the whole of our system, is at full capacity. Uh, and we do not have confidence that the infrastructure that we need in Basildon and across our region will be funded or delivered if we continue to work as an individual authority. Independent research and engagement with our residents and businesses has confirmed over the last two years that change is wanted and that the focus of that change should be around town centres, a new transport system that has proper connectivity, not just east and west, but north and south as well, connecting the different towns of our borough and the different towns of our region, providing infrastructure and homes where people want to live, as well as being in a position to respond to the climate change challenge and environment as a whole. The next slide uh, shows that South Essex has incredible potential. Uh, we all know it, those of us who are uh, councillors and officers in this region. Uh, and this has already been recognised by government in their response to the Thames Estuary Commission. And with the right levels of investment, not over 12 months, not over a couple of years, not even over three or four years. This is a long-term investment. We know that we can create better jobs that are better paid and closer to where people live. We will be able to attract new businesses. We will be able to create bespoke programs alongside our businesses to support up to 5,000 new apprenticeships in our region, while we'll also be able to protect our environment. What we are doing here with this prospectus is we are laying a marker down for what we think the art of the possible is. This is a starting point for a seller in our negotiations with government. And if you can see on the graph, sorry, just go back slightly uh, to the, the last one. As you can see on here, we are talking about 20 billion pounds of uh, investment into our region, 15 billion in growth, 5 billion in private sector investment, 50,000 businesses given support to grow with over 100,000 new jobs created. But to do that, if we move on, is to, ident is to work uh, with government, to build that partnership with the government. And we've already identified programmes that we want to work with the government to invest in. And I mentioned earlier on uh, that the uh, rollout of the digital 5G uh, digital network uh, in the country, a full fiber broadband rollout is underway uh, in our region. But we also want an integrated transport system with active travel, walking, cycling, and a rapid transit linking north, south, east, and west. And we know from the work that we are doing as part of the National Infrastructure Commission, 
that this is something that has been identified by the public as well as by businesses as something that they want. We can also maximize the use of the River Thames. We often tend to look north. If we looked south, we would see that there is huge potential with the River Thames, creating uh, strategic landing points on the Thames between Greys and South End. We also have plans to work with the government to create a new technical university that provides higher skills for our businesses. And we wanna push forward with plans for the regeneration, not just the Basildon and Wickford and Langdon town centres, but town centres all across our region, creating a South Essex Estuary Park, which will be a single park system across the whole of the region that will help us when we come to accelerating infrastructure for homes that people need and that they can afford. So the next slide uh, really shows the growth, the recovery uh, prospectus, especially in light of COVID-19. Uh, this proposal that we are submitting to government is a substantial starting point proposal. Uh, this is a defining time uh, for residents and communities. We've often heard the phrase over the last 15 weeks since coronavirus started, that we need a new normal, that we need to build back better. Uh, our next step will be to open those negotiations with the government over how building back better will actually work in South Essex. Um, this deal, this uh, proposal that we are putting forward uh, here today is just the starting point. I fully expect that the opening pitch, the deal, the goalposts will change at different points uh, over the course of the next few months as the government's devolution white paper, uh, more details of it is published. Um, but crucial to achieving all of this uh, is what is documented on the next slide around uh, appropriate and effective governance. Um, and the proposal that we are putting in uh, to government is about securing substantial long-term investment and new powers from the government. And that will require leadership, transparent decision-making and accountability. As I mentioned earlier on, the government is publishing a devolution white paper just this morning. Myself and the chief executive were on a call with the director general of devolution and decentralization at MHCLG. And we have been engaged in uh, numerous conversations for many, many months with MHCLG over the government's thinking, over what they are looking for, and how this plan of ours will be able to get that level of investment into our region. What you've seen tonight as well is an independent report that has been conducted by Shared Intelligence, uh, who are known to uh, all councillors uh, in Basildon for their previous work that they've done uh, on our local plan, amongst other things. Um, and they have reviewed all of the options and concluded uh, that a combined authority with a mayor is the strongest option. That won't come as a surprise to us here in Basildon, uh, because when we uh, can looked at the Shared Intelligence report and considered their recommendations back in January when it came to Basildon's unitary status, they also indicated at that point that a combined authority with a mayor is a strong option for delivery of infrastructure. The council tonight is not being asked to take a vote or to take a decision on any preferred model of governance. As I said previously, this will change over many uh, different iterations of the deal, of the ask, of the structure that may or may not end up coming into place over the next few months. But councillors will get the final say uh, in a vote uh, as to whether or not Basildon proceeds or not. And subject uh, to those negotiations that we hope to begin uh, in the next few weeks on this substantive proposal, uh, a full decision will come uh, before full council, but that will be informed by the work of the, uh, of the devolution white paper. The final slide here uh, just talks through those next steps. So as I've said previously, we are looking to submit the prospectus uh, to government in the next couple of weeks, uh, which will give the government time to review that proposal ahead of any decisions that they are making in the spending review uh, and the autumn statement. Uh, we are looking forward to those negotiations uh, and I think this is a very good example of how local government has come together across our region for many, many years to work together on uh, a proposal and a prospectus that puts the prosperity 
of our residents and our businesses first, puts politics, puts party division, puts boundaries to one side and says, how can we do something that is really transformative? So we will report back uh, to council in due course. I will look to come back to this committee uh, in uh, September with an update report. Uh, and then of course we will come back to full council if there is any decisions that need to be taken uh, in the autumn or into the winter. Thank you uh, to Democratic Services for sharing uh, that uh, presentation. We can make that presentation uh, available to any member uh, that wishes uh, to uh, review it in more detail uh, after uh, this meeting. Uh, as I say, on the uh, substantive uh, report itself, uh, we are noting uh, the recommendations uh, of the uh, Acela report. Um, and as an opening gambit, that's where we are. Uh, please, uh, I will open this up for questions. If members could uh, indicate via the uh, raising of your hand um, feature on Zoom, uh, that would be uh, beneficial. Uh, otherwise, I will. Oh, I can see Councillor Baggett, you're on my screen. You've got your hand up. Go on, you go, Councillor Baggett, and then we'll. Thank you, Chairman. I'll put my hand up because the, the button for actually using um, the, the blue hand has is, is disappeared, uh, on, at least on my laptop. Um, thank you for that. That was a very comprehensive um, report, and I, I, I thank you for it. Uh, it's a shame that in the two years since you've been um, leader, that this is the first that we've had an update on a seller, and it would have been really nice uh, if backbenchers and the rest of the council have been informed as to the progress on what is a very important matter but the bygones on that um it hasn't been two years i have a number of questions um first of all um do you want me to ask all the questions at once or, or or as we go okay first of all then um could um maybe officers tell me uh, whether these proposals have the support of essex county council um, secondly, um, from probably again from officers, is it their opinion that the combined authority being proposed is large enough to um, warrant uh, the, the government approving it? Um, Councillor Callahan spoke, uh, said that he spoke to MHCLG today. Just wonder whether you could confirm when he last spoke to the minister himself regarding the proposal. Um, maybe officers would give clarification why MHCLG said to hold off from any public consultation. Um, uh, the, again, probably officers might know this, Councillor Callan might know, how much so far it's cost uh, to get to this stage uh, and how many consultants have been hired to get us to this stage. Uh, those are the, 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 the six questions for now. Uh, be really useful to get some feedback. Thank you. And uh, thank you, guys, for your uh, for your uh, for your input there. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor uh, Baggett. So um, I'll deal with a couple, and then I may bring uh, Scott Logan, the Chief Executive, uh, in to to answer a couple as well. In terms of Essex County Council, um, Essex County Council have indicated uh, that they are not in favour of the proposal. Um, there is obviously a, a line of, of thought that if uh, if Essex County Council are against something, you must be doing something right. But that's uh, by the by for now. Um, certainly in terms of the um, standing invitation, there has been an invitation for the last three years for the leader of Essex County Council and the chief executive of Essex County Council to attend a seller meetings. Uh, they have not attended one single meeting uh, in three years. Um, they have delegated responsibility for local government reorganization uh, to um, other cabinet members, uh, now MPs in one case, uh, and uh, to a director, uh, Mark Carroll, who has been attending and working uh, on the data and the evidence and the prospectus uh, that we are now submitting uh, to government, proposing to submit uh, to government. Um, Essex County Council uh, have had a road to Damascus moment uh, in the last uh, fortnight, uh, and they have recognised that the government is actually serious about devolution, something that we've been saying for three years because the evidence has been there wherever you've looked, Buckinghamshire, Northamptonshire, Bournemouth, Suffolk, wherever you wanted to look. Um, but nonetheless, there is now a summit uh, on the 31st of July, uh, next Friday, that I will be attending alongside other leaders across Essex uh, to talk about the issue uh, of local government reorganisation. Uh, I have to say, 
I am not in favour of a super unitary council uh, across South Essex, which is the proposal uh, that uh, is being pushed in private uh, by some members uh, of the county council. That is not something uh, that I would uh, support here. Uh, and so uh, we have taken steps over the last three years to put us in a really strong position uh, on the issue of infrastructure. I know um, every day in opposition seems like a long time, but I have only been uh, back in the leadership chair for a year, not quite two years, but um, as ever, I'm always happy to answer questions uh, about a seller. You asked about whether the combined authority was large enough. And again, this was a conversation that uh, MHCLG were engaged in today, both in terms of unitaries and in terms of combined authority areas. I think what's very interesting about the South Essex region is that population terms, uh, the South Essex proposed combined authority is around 900,000 uh, in population terms. If you consider that in some of the other counties, such as Surrey and, and elsewhere, where they are looking at proposals uh, for unitary, they are uh, just, they're around a, a million, 1.1 1 .1, uh, in terms of their population. And Tees Valley is a very similar uh, combined authority area to what is being proposed in South Essex in terms of size. And I don't think anybody is looking to abolish the Tees Valley combined authority uh, in, in government. I also think it's worth understanding that the Thames Estuary, where we geopolitically sit in a very, very strong uh, position, uh, we are, a, the, the prospectus uh, tells you this in, in detail, we are economically as strong as the entire county of Oxfordshire. So where in some other geographical areas of the country, it may be that combined authorities should be done across county boundaries or um, metropolitan borough areas in the case of Greater Manchester or the Liverpool City region. Uh, in South Essex, you can't just work this out on the basis of population. You also need to work this out on the basis of industry, on the basis of um, the, uh, the economic area. Uh, and that is what uh, is promoted in the uh, framework that we have seen so far and that will be detailed uh, going forward in more detail. So you, you then asked, the third question was about uh, when I had engaged with Simon Clark. Uh, a seller has a, a, a chair and a, and a vice chair, uh, Councillor Rob Gledhill from Thurrock and Councillor Chris Hossack of Brentwood uh, are the chairs and vice chairs. They have been engaging uh, directly uh, with government uh, and then also um, our, our officers, our chief executives uh, have been engaging with officials uh, in uh, Westminster as well. Uh, so there is a very joined up approach to what we are doing uh, as a six and the conversations that we are having uh, with uh, the government. Uh, I will bring Scott in just to answer the question uh, around uh, the advice that we received from CLG on uh, the issue of public consultation. Uh, and then, of course, we can answer the question of cost as well. Uh, so if I can bring you in, Scott. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, just to add to a couple of your, your points and then answer directly the, the consultation question um, is I think I think the the point raised around whether are big enough and where why South Essex the growth corridor. Just to remind members, obviously about the Thames Estuary Commission report, which has been going on for some time, and that actually South Essex was uh, seen as a sub region of the Thames Estuary. So it's one of the reasons why the growth corridor and the link with the Thames Estuary is is part of the prospectus and where uh, leaders and chief execs with conversations were, were going. To pick up the second point, uh, it, it recently, and particularly with the uh, before the white paper announcement, which is only in the last uh, week or two from, from Simon Clark, uh, we were uh, pursuing uh, conversations with, with civil servants around a, uh, a bid based on the prospectus. Um, and uh, there have never been conversations around whether um, they're the size of the, the combined authority but but what was said is that this is a negotiation so we shouldn't be uh have putting uh, all the detail going to public consultation without having the conversations with ministers it was a negotiation as you said it's the first stage so there was pushback around doing any public consultation till such time as ministers were having conversations 
as proposed as part of the, the report. Uh, in terms of the costs, I, I, I'm not sure I can answer that off the top of my head, but certainly I can get Councillor Baggett the, the cost of the consultant. Um, we're predominantly, uh, there's been money put in the budget over the last uh, year or two uh, by the council, particularly in, in terms of resources around the joint uh, strategic spatial plan. And then also uh, to uh, we jointly to employ um, uh, Blue Marble uh, through Martin Whiteley, uh, who has acted as a support uh, to um, the uh, chief execs and leaders. Um, and uh, but certainly I can um, find out how much uh, uh, for you, Councillor Baggett, uh, in detail and come back to you. OK, thank you. We'll get that answer in writing. But, I, you know, as you've said, the last two budgets that the council have passed uh, have included uh, money for uh, the uh, work of a seller, and that is pooled. Uh, across not just the six uh, local authorities, but also the county uh, contribute uh, into that as well. Uh, I have Councillor uh, Sullivan, who is next, and then uh, Councillor Buckley. Um, Councillor Sullivan. If, well, I, I would like to come back if I, if I may. Um, okay, normally cool. the process we, we, we have. Um, uh, thank you again for, for the answer you've given. Um, based upon that, and it is a bit disappointing that, that neither the leader of the council nor the chief executive know the actual cost, because I'd have thought that quite fundamentally, especially when we're talking about finances post-COVID and, and what money we may or may not have within the council. But um, you, you said that this report is just for noting. And I'm concerned about that because when a report is for noting, what it is essentially also saying is carry on officers doing your thing. Uh, and I do have concern about that. Uh, so I would like to amend the recommendation um, and, and I would like to amend it to that this council follows the advice from MHCLG to hold off from any public consultation and suspends all further work until the release of the government's white paper on local government reform in September. Okay, thank you, Council. We will come to your uh, amendment, uh, but before we uh, speak to that amendment, I did have councillors Sullivan and Buckley uh, who wish to speak on the substantive. So we will deal with that and then come back uh, to the uh, recommendation as amended uh, that you are proposing. Councillor Sullivan. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to make a point, really. Um, obviously, the, um, the fundamental uh, requirement for this is we get a, a lot of government funding uh, to drive the infrastructure that we're going to need in the county to make this sort of thing a reality. Um, my point is, until and unless we have um, the definite government commitment to fund an upgrade on the A127, which I think should be three lanes, as well as the A13. And I think also that um, we will want to see uh, Shenfield, the crossrail extended beyond Shenfield, probably to South End. Unless and until we get those sort of commitments, I don't think that any large scale uh, structural redevelopment in this part of the world is feasible. Now, I know the, the report says, oh, we're expecting lots of money, but, you know, that's, that's not written in stone. So it could be that we just end up with a load of housing. But until as such time as the government, whoever it is, gives a commitment that those three major transport routes are going to be upgraded to be able to take this, um, I really don't think that uh, the proposals would be sustainable. That was just a point I'm on the make. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Councillor Buckley. Yeah, thank you, and, um, Just a, a couple of questions, really. If you need a formal seconder for Councillor Baggett, I'll do that safe coming back and speaking. Um, but, um, I, I think all of us welcome the ambition created by a seller. But uh, I, I just have to pose a, a, a few questions. I'm not necessarily convinced that the combined authority is the right model, although I do think that uh, local government reorganisation in one form or another is inevitable. Um, but um, a seller is quite obviously just looking at um, South Essex. Going back to the time when I was leader and we had Thames Gateway, there were discussions at that time with the South Thames authorities, which had many similarities to our own. And given that we've got the Lower Thames crossing as probably the only significant piece of infrastructure coming up, um, I think that there is perhaps some margin for discussion with those authorities to see 
where we can actually benefit from from uh, working together. And just in terms of the report itself, um, there's a series of bullet points on page 21. Um, and I, I just draw your attention to the fact that a seller is saying, let's create 100,000 new jobs by 2050. Fine, great. And to help 50,000 businesses to grow and increase their productivity. Whilst we're clearly dependent on SMEs in this area, that's only an average of two jobs per business. Um, if you really want to be ambitious, I would think that number should be significantly higher than that. Um, I do welcome your comments about a north-south link because I think linking Basildon, Chelmsford, Colchester would actually be a major economic benefit to all three parts of the county. So I think that is something which would be welcome. Um, and I, I'm not fussed whether it's a light rail, light docklands, or whether it's something more substantial. But we do need that, that ability to uh, commute. And on page uh, 22, sorry, I have to flip the screen as I go through, um, just a comment about um, option three, which was about establishing a local development corporation. And we've all criticised much of what's gone on in Basildon in the past, largely because an unelected development corporation planned and decided what to build, where to build it. And I, I think that the elected members of the council know better than an unelected development corporation. Um, the other point that you rightly made was any changes should not be based just on population. I completely agree with that. Um, the economic strength of the south of Essex is something that needs to be um, I was going to say built upon, but I think John Prescott got criticised for using that phrase about the green belt. Um, but um, we do need we do need to expand our uh, economic base, and um, we do need to be looking to encourage future industries to be to be part of that. Um, yeah, I left school best part of fifty years ago, and um, then pretty much all of us would have expected to have a job using our hands on tools. Nowadays, there are very few of that type of job. I think we have to we have to link that in with education and training, and to make sure that we actually deliver people that are fit for the jobs, not that are available today, but that will be available in twenty years or so time. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor. Let me just come back on on a couple of those points, and then uh, I'll invite anyone else who wishes to speak uh, on this. Uh, I, I take the point from Councillor Sullivan uh, in relation to um, uh, the major infrastructure uh, works that we all want to see on the 127, on the A13 and on the, on the railways. And I think that that is right. The reality is that the purpose of doing what we are doing here is that we then start that negotiation and discussion with government. Uh, and so we say to them very clearly, you cannot build the, the number of homes that you're telling councillors that they want that you want us to build because it magically comes up with that number in a formula in a Whitehall calculator unless you do these kind of infrastructure improvements and even then you're playing catch up to 30 years uh, of underinvestment in the infrastructure so I have to say I think to Councillor Sullivan's point this is the the only show in town in terms of being able to say to government let's have that conversation about infrastructure let's get the money into the region but we are talking about significant amounts of money. We're talking about billions and billions of pounds coming into our region, but the government having the, the, uh, the, the confidence that there is a vehicle to be able to deliver. Now, I understand. I, I, I hear the point that Councillor Buckley has said around a combined authority. Is it the right model? And that, again, is open to uh, different interpretations as the white paper evolves and conversations with government evolve. But I, I have three, I've had in my career three bosses. Uh, all three of them are now mayors of combined authorities. Uh, so I have some understanding of what a combined authority does. It is not a council. Uh, and that is something that we need to be very clear in our own mind. It is not a council. It is a ministerial department in the region project managing infrastructure in a way that no council has got the headroom to be able to do. There is no way that you can do children's and adults and, 
uh, roads and highways and everything else, whilst also managing major infrastructure works that cross borough boundaries and deliver a light rail service across South Essex. There is no way that any council would be able to do that. So that is what a, a combined authority uh, is there to do. And I take the point about uh, talking to um, colleagues on the south of the estuary. Of course, we do that with Opportunity South Essex. We have regular conversations with the south. They are also looking at exploring a similar model themselves. And I think we need to, to be reminded, don't we, that there are, we're not seeking here to try and reinvent the wheel. We have the LEP, the Local Enterprise Partnership, which is the biggest in the, in the country, is the one that we're involved in here in the southeast, and it doesn't work. It doesn't deliver the kind of money into our region that provides localised decision making and that delivers for our, our locality. You've only got to look in Basildon Town Centre. There's eight million pounds worth of work going on from the left that will probably be ripped up in 12 months when the master plan goes through and we start building the new town centre. Uh, but they wouldn't listen. Uh, so where was the localised decision making when it came uh, to that decision? It wasn't there. And it wasn't even there when we made that case. Uh, to the county council. Uh, none of us uh, want to see a local development corporation. I am pleased to hear Councillor Buckley say that. I have a plea, Councillor Buckley. Please tell your colleagues at county council we don't want a local development corporation because I have sat around the table at a cellar and listened to the county council's representative who is asking us to look into development corporations uh, coming to uh, Basildon and to the South Essex region. I am against that. Like you, I would not sign Basildon up uh, to anything like that. So please, I ask you uh, to make that case. You talked about the economic base and future industries and skills. And again, that is exactly what a seller is looking to do. A university technical college, uh, you know, getting people on the tools, working with their hands, going into uh, local careers in our advanced manufacturing economy and in the technology economy that exists uh, here uh, in our borough. That is exactly what we uh, are trying to do uh, with this uh, proposal uh, tonight. I, I do think it is disappointing, uh, I have to say, that I've not heard uh, from uh, the Leader of the Opposition uh, views about jobs, views about, views about infrastructure, about how uh, if it's not this plan, it has to be another plan. Uh, and speaking to the uh, amendment, uh, that he has uh, tabled and seconded by Councillor Buckley uh, for a moment. We can't wait. We can't sit on the sidelines. Uh, three years ago, when the last round of combined authorities and devolution deals and city deals were going through, there were 34 applications from different regions of the country for devolution deals of some form or another. Uh, only, I think, six got through at the time. So we are in competition with a lot of other regions of the country uh, and your government uh, is pursuing a levelling up uh, agenda where they want to put money into the north of the country. If we sit on our hands, if we row back and we accept the amendment tonight and we say let's not engage with the government and let's kick this into the long grass, we will miss a vital opportunity to put Basildon and South Essex at the front of the queue to have conversations with government over how we get that money into our region. So I will be voting against uh, any proposal tonight that seeks to delay what we are doing. Uh, I would say very strongly that what we are doing in terms of our engagement with MHCLG is the right approach uh, to take. And I think we should fully endorse uh, the prospectus that is here tonight, and uh, we should get behind uh, the proposals that we want to put into MHCLG. I've seen that, Council Bank, you have indicated, uh, and so as you have tabled this amendment to delay, I will allow you to come back in. Thank you, Chairman. Um, you, you said I didn't mention uh, jobs or infrastructure. Well, uh, just on the record, I am very, very pro creating jobs, very, very pro uh, infrastructure. When I uh, went down to a cellar, having taken the leadership uh, when we were in administration, uh, the first thing that we had conversations about was moving the debate from let's build homes at all costs, irrespective, uh, in order to hope that we might get infrastructure in the future, to making the conversation about grow the economy, grow the borough, put infrastructure first, um, and everything else, uh, including homes, comes as a secondary consideration. 
And we as an administration, both in administration and in opposition, have done, uh, I would argue, more towards uh, fighting the corner for infrastructure first and for growing the economy and jobs uh, than the, the Alliance has done. However, having spoken to one of the leaders of the seller, I understand that, first of all, Unitary wasn't even considered before being dismissed, that uh, the mayor that uh, is proposed has a veto over the joint committees, that it's an extra layer of bureaucracy and how you may, way you want to dress it up, that means extra burden on the taxpayer uh, for having a mayor with his own office of core, uh, probably his own office, who knows how much that might cost. Um, and more importantly, that all local plans would become suspended. So when all of a sudden 10,000 homes get proposed to be built in Nethermain, the town centre, Wickford, Langdon, Langdon Hills, well, we have no say because it will be all down to the mayor and the leaders of the um, South Essex uh, combined authority don't get a look in. So effectively, this proposal sells out Basildon to build, take on the lion's share of 90,000 plus homes, which you're already seen already being proposed in the town centre. The minister has been clear that South Essex isn't suitable for a combined authority. The minister doesn't want it. Five of the MPs don't want it. Essex County Council don't want it. Rochford don't want it. The public haven't even been informed about it. This to me is yet another on a growing list of expensive white elephants being proposed under your administration and propped up by Labour supporting independents. Uh, just to stake a claim on your road to Westminster. We don't support the direction of travel, nor the thinking behind it. We can't support it. Uh, thank you. Uh, before I bring Councillor Smith in, um, thank God you are no longer leader of this authority. Um, I don't think David Finch could have said it any better if he was sitting here uh, at one of our meetings. Uh, absolute nonsense. Uh, we, we listen to this thing about infrastructure first, and if I just keep saying infrastructure first, then suddenly a third lane will appear on the A127. Uh, no actual plan of how to deliver it, because the kind of money that would be needed to put a third lane onto the 127 or onto the A13 is enormous. There is one junction, one junction, in the local plan that your administration passed that would currently cost 240 million pounds for one junction on the A127. And somehow you want to convince the public in Basildon and beyond that you had a plan to deliver the GP surgeries, the schools, the road network improvements, the uh, improvements to the dual carriageways that we want to see. It's fantasy. Uh, in and of ourselves, no leader, there's three of us on this uh, call tonight who've all sat in the leader's chair uh, in Basildon Council. None of us can put our hand on our heart and say, we can go up to Westminster and come back with half a billion pounds for improvements in our road network, because we wouldn't get it. The only way to get infrastructure on the size and scale that Basildon needs, because for 30 years, it's just been clocking up and up and up in terms of what is needed, is to go to government with a 30 year plan with proper levels of investment. He talks about this issue that Unitary wasn't discussed. Unitary was discussed. The reason I signed the MOU in January 2018 was because I was satisfied that the conversations that we had, all six authorities were not in favor of forming a South Essex Unitary Authority. If it is the conservative position in Basildon that you want us to join a South Essex Unitary Council, that is 900,000 people strong, will not ever be able to do anything because it will be too big and overbearing, then please lay that out. I would never sign Basildon up to that. It would be a monster of a council. It would not be able uh, to exercise its functions. So categorically in 2017-18, when we did discuss the issue of Unitary, Gagan Mahendra, who was there from Essex County Council, because David Finch didn't turn up, uh, we had Louise McKinley, who was the chair uh, at the time, they can vouch for it. We were very clear that Unitary was not an option. He talks about a mayor. I know where he's going with this, and I know who he's obviously been speaking to when it comes to uh, issues about planning. Uh, it is an utter nonsense to say that mayors control planning. Uh, I, I know three of them. I'm sure they'd love it if they could control planning. They tell me regularly they'd love it if they could control planning. They can't. 
It is a complete nonsense. Planning legislation, the decision making for planning, it exists at the district or the unitary level. Uh, you can shake your head as much as you want. It is a fact. Uh, and I, I know that somebody thought that eight years ago when they wrote the legislation that they were giving away planning powers. Well, there's been an evolution. There's been nine combined authorities that have been created uh, since that legislation was written. And in every single case, it has been the case that planning powers have not transferred for housing and everything else to be delivered by a mayor. The sovereignty, the decision making remains at the local level. And again, if you read the prospectus and if you bothered to go into the detail of the prospectus, you can see very clearly that we have made it clear that planning of autonomy must remain in the hands of the local authorities. And then you, you, you talk about the, uh, the issue of, of tax and, and a precept. And again, this is about not believing in Basildon, not believing in the combined authority region to be able to negotiate the deal. You negotiate into the transformation fund the amount that it will cost to run the, the office of, of the combined authority. That, that is what you do. You don't levy a precept because, as I've said before, the, the combined authority is not a council. If the mayor decides that they want to come along and there is a manifesto commitment to say they're going to levy a precept and they're going to levy a bit of tax, I think they'd be stupid and pretty brave to say they were going to do it, but that's something that they might want to do. But in the deal that was struck with government, and we've, we've discussed this as a seller, we will not be asking for a precept. We will be putting into the transformation fund, into the deal, money to be able to fund the office of the combined uh, authority. So I, I have to say, the scaremongering about there's going to be thousands of homes here and there's going to be this and there's going to be that, it's for the birds. And you're three years out of date. And I'm hearing the same arguments from Councillor Baggett that I heard from David Finch just a month ago. And now you're playing catch up because you're behind the times on where local government is going. And I, I say to you, get on board with this, Councillor Baggett. You are wrong to be objecting to a major deal. Because if you, and the challenge for you, the challenge for the opposition, if you are against this, then you have to say very, very clearly now, not not in, in, in a year's time, not whenever, now, today, on this call, you have to tell me and the residents of this borough and the businesses who back this in the borough, you've got to tell us, where's your plan for £20 billion for infrastructure coming to Basildon? Where is it? I'll allow you back in if you've got an answer to that question. I'll tell you where it isn't. It isn't with a deal where you've got Rochford, they've already Wasn't said the they're question. pulling out that Wasn't Essex the County Council have the ultimate veto, the minister doesn't want it. So actually what you're doing is you're, you're, you're selling the sizzle when there isn't even any sausage in the pan. Um, so asking the question about what is going to be, um, what we would be doing is we would be thinking it through a little bit more than clearly has been. We would be engaging with the public earlier, given that I know your penchant is not to engage the public at all in anything, uh, because you you treat the public with contempt, uh, and so do a number of your your councillors with the the way they're they're spoken to on Facebook and Twitter by uh, people within your uh, group. Uh, we would engage with the public. We would engage with the MPs a lot earlier, uh, taking the point of working with rather than trying to present a faint accompli, uh, and collectively coming up with the right solution that's going to deliver the infrastructure that is so desperately needed. But this has been cat-handed from the, the get-go. Uh, and, and the proof of the pudding is, you're talking here about a proposal, which you well know, legislation says that if Essex County say no, it's dead in the water anyway. So we're having a debate here about something that isn't going to happen. Okay, uh, Councillor Baggett, I urge you to diversify your sources of information. Uh, because the individual who is feeding you is wrong. Uh, the county council are in a bad place when it comes to this, because the only thing that the legislation says is that they can't be in more than one. So if they don't want to be in our one, I'm fine with that. They can go in the North Essex Combined Authority, or the North East Essex Combined Authority. They cannot stop it and they can't be a veto. 
Cambridgeshire and Peterborough is your example. Go and look at the constitution in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. You'll be able to see very clearly that they were not able to stop the formation of a combined authority. You talk about, I would engage with the MPs. Well, one, one of the MPs I understand from a conversation has said that the only way to get money out of government is to lobby the government for your MP. I must have been missing where they've been for the last 19 years, because there hasn't been particularly great success at getting money into this region for infrastructure. Maybe I've missed that, but there hasn't been the improvements that we've seen, to, or we've needed to see to the 127, the A13 and others. So there's lots of noise coming. There's not an, an awful lot of action. Um, I, I'm obviously uh, told that, you know, uh, I uh, am engaging uh, too much. I'm using social media. I use the press office too much. Now uh, I don't engage uh, enough with the public. I'm probably the most accessible leader that Basildon Council has ever had uh, in terms of meeting and speaking with the public, including at three o'clock this afternoon, uh, having conversations with the public about uh, where they want to go to next. I, I'm also confused. Am I trying to become the mayor of South Essex or a member of parliament? Because it changes every 10 minutes. You have great faith in me, Councillor Bagger. Uh, and my electoral success. I know that you've got good reason to believe in my electoral success, um, but nonetheless, uh, I have to say it, it's a nonsense. Here we are as an administration putting politics, boundaries, all of that to one side to just say the A127 runs through six council areas. The A13 runs through five council areas. Why don't we do something about trying to join up the infrastructure, trying to create better connectivity, Try and support our businesses rather than trying to cling on to outdated governance systems that give an old boys network a few extra quid if we carry on with the status quo. I don't think that's the right thing to do. So that's why the Acela proposal before you is not something we should just wait. We've been waiting 30 years to get a proposal on the table for how infrastructure money is going to work. Why would we wait any longer? When the government come along, I, I say this very gently, diversify your sources of information, Councillor Bagger. The idea that the, the minister has categorically said, no, we cannot progress, is not true. Uh, and I'll say that very clearly, it is not true. Uh, and so I will wait uh, patiently to hear your alternative for how you are going to come up with £20 billion. Pounds. I know, as a good conscientious councillor, you've spent the last 20 years on this authority thinking up. Councillor Bagger. Well, Councillor Callaghan, um, I, I hear what you're saying. And what you're saying is either I'm wrong or you're wrong. So we will know by the next meeting of PNR. And I'm sure I will be gracious enough if I'm wrong and my source of information is incorrect. I'll be gracious enough to report back to this committee that I got it wrong. And I'm hoping that when the reverse happens, you will have the good grace to do the same. And then... Isn't what I'd be interested to know is what your backup plan is when the wheels have fallen off this one trick pony. Thank you. Uh, don't you worry about that. There's plenty up the sleeve. Uh, and secondly, what I would say as well to you, uh, Councillor Bagger, is if you are telling me and if the government tells me that they are going to throw out three years worth of work, that they are going to turn their backs uh, on 20 billion pounds of, of, of uh, investment in this region, on 100,000 jobs, on 50,000 new businesses, because five MPs are against it, perhaps the government isn't quite as strong as either you or I might hope it would be. Councillor Smith, you have indicated. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Just to keep it brief, because we do have a busy agenda, what other options are there? What other are there? As Einstein said, the definition of stupidity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Four of the partners of Acela are run by the Conservatives. This is Conservative policy. And if we get an elected mayor, they will likely be Conservative and you'll be needing to crate away their vote. Why would me, why would we, Councillor Callaghan, be putting our necks out to give a Conservative a really good job? Because it is to get the investment into South Essex. All throughout this COVID-19 crisis, for example, many of these elected mayors have been on news night fighting for the region, making points. I mean, there was one quite recently, I believe it was Andy Burnham, talking about getting uh, local authorities the data so they could have people uh, with infected with COVID-19 to help the track and trace. 
that's one that has said set it. But when there's a problem in South Essex, what do any of our MPs able to do? Stand up in the House of Commons, catch the speakers eye if they're lucky, say a few words, the Prime Minister of the day, that's money head, and that's the end of that. What we want is someone to bang on doors and fight for this part of the world because every penny spent on South Essex is a return into the government's coffers. And I just hope, Mr Chairman, we can get the centre fully agreed and carried on so we can get this directly elected mayor to start the long and tedious task of putting South Essex back on the map and having the infrastructure be fit in this part of the world. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, thank you, Councillor Smith. Do we have any uh, other uh, members uh, of the committee who wish uh, to speak? Uh, Councillor Brown? I can't see you, actually. No. No. Councillor McGurran? So, sorry, I, I didn't realise you'd seen me, so um, I apologise if I was waving in an inappropriate way. Um, I'd just like to say I think a lot of what Councillor Buckley said was very sensible. Um, I think, you know, in terms of infrastructure and in terms of transport, the east-west thing needs improving. We get that, but it, at least it is there. The north-south thing within Essex is utterly atrocious, and that needs a lot of work. So, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I'm not just saying that because... Before the meeting, Malcolm was very good on the Northwest football divide issue, uh, but I do appreciate that and I will be very grateful for that for a long time. Uh, but I just think this, you know, a lot of what I was going to say is now redundant because Gavin said it, Kerry said it. It's what, you know, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. The big investment will not come from anywhere else so if we don't go down this route my question is as Gavin said is what do we do Essex really you know and the whole shift of the government is against the you know the county unitary authorities which don't work sadly they're too big they're wrong in all sorts of ways they don't work so we have to reinvent the wheel. And this is a really good way of reinventing the wheel. And like, either you, you, you're with us and you want loads of investment for Basildon, or you don't. Very simple. Thank you, Councillor McGowan. Councillor Harrison. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, can I say, I've, I've listened to the arguments here, and I think the... I'm actually surprised because I would have thought this was something that all 42 councillors of this borough would have been supporting. Yeah. We've got six local authorities of different political opinions working together across South Essex to try and get investment into this area. It won't come in many of our lifetimes, but it will be a start. Now, Councillor Baggett, I'm absolutely surprised at because he hasn't come up the answer, where do we get the money from if we don't do it this way? I'd love to know, what have we achieved over the last 30 or 40 years in this borough in terms of infrastructure? A Billericay Park Relief Road, a Wickford Park Relief Road, a uh, straightening, not straightening, a, a roundabout removed at the Fortune of War, very little total investment in infrastructure by the government in this borough. This is, in my opinion, this is the best way to achieve it. And please think of the future of youngsters in this borough, not us, because unless we do something like this, and this is not tonight saying, yes, we're going to do it, it's going to go ahead. It's the first, in my view, the first footstep down the road. So let's take this opportunity, because I think the people of the borough deserve it. Thank you, uh, Councillor Harrison. Uh, I'm going to move to the vote. So, Councillor Bay, can I ask you to repeat your uh, recommendation for us? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Chairman. Um, that, that this council follows the advice from MHCLG to hold off from any public consultation 
and suspends all further work until the release of the government's white paper on local government reform in September. Oh, thank you. And that was seconded earlier on by Councillor Buckley. Uh, so can I ask all committee members uh, to uh, unmute themselves? I'm going to take a vote on that uh, mm -hmm. amendment to the recommendation. Yeah. Uh, I will start. I'm going to vote against. Uh, Councillor Smith. Yeah. Against. Councillor Brown. Against. Councillor McGurran. 100% against. Councillor Baggett. Four. Councillor Sullivan. Four. Councillor Buckley. I didn't hear you then. I saw your lips move. Oh. Okay. Uh, thank you. So uh, the uh, amendment uh, has fallen. Uh, the report asks us merely to uh, note this report. And I think, uh, as we've said before, it's a case of either you're with us or you're against the uh, major infrastructure investment that we have uh, alluded to uh, throughout that report. So uh, thank you, uh, members, for it. And as I've said, I will bring a report uh, back to our September meeting. Uh, and I ask uh, Sarah just to note that. Uh, in the minutes so that we can uh, bring that report to uh, our September meeting and, and make any amendments to the work plan uh, as necessary. Thank you. Uh, agenda item uh, six is on the uh, community uh, governance review proposals. Um, uh, just open it up here. So as uh, members know, we've taken uh, a number of uh, reports through PNR uh, over the last uh, 12 months or so uh, on the creation of uh, new parish uh, and town councils, Wickford uh, Town Council being the most advanced uh, of the uh, proposals thus far, but we've also received uh, some representations and some interest from elsewhere uh, in the borough, particularly in Langdon uh, Park. Uh, but we are looking to do further work on exploring that. And I know uh, that Councillor Devlin, the chair of the Billericay uh, Town Council, has also indicated uh, a desire to potentially look at more um, responsibilities, powers, services, uh, being uh, in the control of the Billericay uh, Town Council. Uh, the rep I have met uh, uh, in recent weeks with the uh, shadow Wickford Town Council that we uh, uh, set up in our vote uh, previously. Uh, and we uh, have spoken to them about, uh, as we previously said, the beauty of doing it the way that we did it was that they would be in control of um, indicating what their first precept would be if they were uh, to get the go ahead. Uh, where we are now in the process, as recommendation one uh, sets out, is that there now needs to follow the next round of public consultation. Uh, and I think that what is clear here and, and um, what I would uh, say as, as a way of introduction before uh, I ask Mr. Birkinshaw to uh, say anything else on the report, uh, is that the council, in respect of the Wickford proposal, uh, has in essence uh, done our bit. We've taken them uh, to the position where they are now uh, and it is on the uh, promoters of the Wickford Town Council uh, in this public consultation to win the support uh, of the public. That will be difficult. They know that. We have had discussions with them uh, in relation to uh, precepts and the potential for um, the council tax to increase uh, both the county and at the police level when it comes to COVID and every other uh, council uh, in the country and all of the things that people are talking about there and weather levying. Uh, new precepts and new taxes, uh, they have to be upfront and honest about their plans to do that. So uh, with that report, uh, sorry, with that being said, um, they are fully aware of what it is that they were looking to do, They're fully aware of what it is that they want to do uh, in respect of um, services that they want to provide. And now again, as I say, they have to go and win the support of the public through this consultation. Uh, Mr. Birkinshaw, I don't know if you have anything you wish to add to uh, what I've said about the reports. Uh, nothing, Chairman, on the uh, Wickford proposal that is set out and would form the basis of um, consultation um, and, and the, the process for that is set out, but we need further development. I think just to um, pick out the other two key issues from the report, you did allude to, and it is referenced in the report, about the creation of Wickford would see pretty much the whole of the north of the borough, north of the A127 parished. Um, and I think we're seeking a steer from the committee this evening around proposals for parishing in the south of the borough. Uh, there's no firm policy basis for that as yet. And, and therefore, I think we further to discussion with yourself, didn't feel appropriate to simply bring forward proposals. And when we seek a steer, the only basis which we 
are guided by to a degree is uh, is the establishment in the north and the breakthrough commission report which which set out um the benefit of some arrangements and what that might have and it's felt that a policy proposal around parishes might be appropriate for that so as I say, I think just, uh, I don't think I'm going to get to the absolute and I don't expect boundaries to be drawn, but I suppose I'm, I'm seeking to see, uh, do members, do, do this committee wish for proposal for parishing in the South to come forward to the next committee for consideration? Uh, as, as with the Whitford proposal, they would be subject to public consultation as well. So it is uh, proposals as the basis for public consultation. Um, so the committee may, may decide that they don't want any proposal bringing forward or they may and a steer about what they feel they may wish to see with regards to either town or parishes and just finally the third element of the report is to update on the direction of travel and I think this committee and yourself have been clear about how um, the role of local councils, the development of them, the devolution of assets and services and the establishment of local councils for hand in glove really uh, and I know you've made that point to Whitford that you would wish to see as a large town council then playing a significant role in the area if one was to be established. So we update on that work, I've set out um, attached an enclosure from NALC and the LGA which I hope is useful for members and reiterate some of the direction of travel. Uh, we will be accelerating that work and take it forward alongside the proposals around actually establishing parishes and uh, we'll come back to the committee later in the year on those matters but the two recommendations particularly the key issue is a uh, fairly uh, thank you uh mr birkinshaw can i ask uh, uh any member i i just want to double check because on the on the hands that are waving at me on this screen i've got councillor sullivan buckley bagger are they all indicated that you wish to speak nod your heads if that's true yeah and then councillor smith so let me take it in the order that they are appearing on here councillor sullivan um yeah thank you chairman um sorry uh so of course in favor of progressing with the uh, wickford town council proposal um but i would like the um assurance that that uh, proposal um, will be sort of divorced from the community government's review um, because I think now uh, enough work has been done on Wickford um, that we can progress without it having to be entangled in the governance review and um, I think that that would um, sort of unduly slow down the process. With regard to the governance review proposing um, looking at parishes south of the 127, um, well, I would be completely against imposing any parishes on any particular area. Um, I think there must be a significant demand in that area. I think the difficulty you will always have in a larger conurbation like Basildon is that you don't have uh, sort of individually defined areas. You know, Lee Chapel North merges into Langdon, which merges into Langdon Hills. And it's a lot more difficult where people will have um, identification with uh, a sort of geographical area that you would need for a town or parish council. I mean, you might do it in small sort of neighbourhood or, or just um, housing estate areas, but not really on a sort of scale that um, you would you would have a town and parish council. So, um, we've in previous meetings, um, Councillor Rimmer had um, proposed that the governance review be um, put back uh, because he was concerned that the uh, the impact of COVID not only would it hinder people um, participating in it but also they they just got other things on their mind. Whatever happens to him. So they got other things on their mind other than local governance um, uh, arrangements you know it's just not a thing that people are interested in really. So um, I would like to propose that we either extend the consultation period for the governance review uh, or maybe start it later and finish it later um, so that we sort of come out of the, uh, the sort of the, the whole or to, to as much as we can the sort of influence that the COVID's having on you know people's lives and and their outlook and everything so that then we would have I would, I would think a much better or more representative outcome from it than uh, we would do if, if we were to undertake it at the moment. So um, 
Well, so I would ask the officers then, um, is that possible that we could delay the governor's review or start it, you know, or finish it later, something like that? Could I have a response on that, please, Jim? Mr. Bergenshaw? Yeah, I mean, I think important to clarify um, the, the issue, really. I mean, the, the community government review covers the whole of the borough. Uh, the Whitford proposal is within that, and it's, it's necessary to do a a public consultation on the detailed proposals that I've set out in the report, and that is what we intend to undertake. Um, so I think just there's the clarity around that. There is an issue the committee may feel, and that's the, the point about recommendation two, that they are content from the governance review to simply progress Whitford and don't wish to see any proposals being brought back as the basis for public consultation for the rest of the borough. And, and that would then be uh, part really and the only issue from the governance review we would take forward is is around Wickford um, but that just um, the steer on the committee so I think a slight confusion in terms of some of what uh, was being asked I think the issue around people engaging uh, certainly in the Wickford one where we will have to do public consultation feel that we can't do that we are undertaking the annual electoral canvas um, and that, which obviously involves all residents um, but we, whether it's appropriate to consult uh, on proposals for the south of the borough, uh, I'll be guided by the committee this evening as to which to do, whether to see some proposals come back to the next meeting. Uh, and that would obviously be another opportunity to consider whether it would be an appropriate time, what the implication. Yeah, could I come back on that, Chairman? Yeah, yeah. On. Uh, I, Well, I, I agree with what um, Paul was saying in, in the latter part of his comments here, really. Um, I'd like to see the week for progressed. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I think the, the government should be held in abeyance um, and, uh, you know, we would see a later committee meeting if, if it is appropriate to, to carry on with that. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm asking other councillors now if they can comment on that and then and perhaps we can, um, we can get a consensus. Okay, uh, I will... Um make sure you get uh, a bit of an answer to that as we go through the debate and then we will come back to that uh, proposition. Um, Councillor Buckley, you've indicated next. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, perhaps there are a bit separately about uh, compared to the rest of the borough, but uh, I think from the point of view of those people that uh, have been involved and the Shadow Town councillors they now are, it's a disappointment that uh, the implementation of any town council won't happen until 2022, given that this started so long ago. Um, the governor, uh, sorry, the um, consultation, I am rather concerned about. Um, there is clearly a division between those in favour and those against. And yet within the report, it suggests the consultation can be done within a budget of £3,000. Um, unless you can tell me that uh, somebody can wave a magic wand, I don't think that's adequate to do a consultation of the three main wards of Wickford. And it is important that if the town council is established, that it has the support of the um, I'd just like to comment as well on um, a couple of other points mentioned in it. First of all, the number of parish councillors. Um, 20 may well be appropriate um, if it is established, um, but I have concerns because I sit on a number of parish councils in my role as a county member, and the number of parish councils where parish councillors have dropped out and they've had to co-opt rather than elect people. Um, I'm not in favour of co-option to any, any level of government. Um, I think it's inappropriate. But um, whilst at the moment there is clearly significant interest from uh, the, the steering group that actually drove this project, um, I am just concerned that um, when they find the frustrations of government at any level, um, some of them may drop out. And it may, it may well be difficult to uh, recruit others. Um, yeah, I have said previously I would not be a candidate. I stand by that now and I will not be standing for the town council if it is established. Um, so in that regard, I have no interest in it. But uh, I, I do think that you need to look again at the consultation. If it is not a thorough consultation, 
then you're going to have um, a reaction from those people that did not support it. Okay, thank you. Councillor Baggett. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, as for Wickford, I mean, we, we have always been supporting Wickford in, in pursuing this. And, and I echo the comment that it is it is a shame that it seems to be so far ahead before it's likely to be formed. But I also understand that there is a process to go through in these things. But uh, on record, uh, we, we totally support and will continue to support uh, those people that are putting themselves up into the firing line to um, to work hard to, to represent their borough at whatever level. Um, the issue about the other, I, I do think that if, if we don't feel that we can consult um, with a wider population and get it done now, it actually is worth holding off to make sure we get it right. Uh, we, we've just seen how long it takes to, to get something up and running anyway. So, doing something right and getting it right uh, and maybe having to wait a couple of months is far more preferable than pushing something together now uh, and, and, and not getting it as, as we would like. Um, what was missing though, um, and I don't know whether it was just um, ju just a discrepancy, uh, it, it lists the areas that might be considered um, for any future governance review, but uh, North Pitsy was wasn't there. Um, and it just seemed that maybe Pitsy had been forgotten somehow. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Baggett, for that. Um, can members hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Oh, sorry. I've just got a message that there's a bit of an echo on my... Uh, is that? Is it still there? No. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I will uh, address uh, each of these points uh, after we've heard from, from members and then I'll come back to the point that raised, was raised by uh, Councillor uh, Sullivan. Next up, we have uh, Councillor Kerry Smith and then Councillor Brock. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I mean, my concern with the present existing setup of local government in uh, Basildon. I think any new parishes being imposed on the areas south of the 127 would not be fair to them. I mean, parishes that were based in rural areas, areas where funding is stretched and limited, and there is not the population for the big county or borough or district to fill in the spaces. And this is where parish councils are quite popular and they're quite successful. But I think in an urban setting, it's hard for them to work. So, and also we've had this consultation, and I can't, looking for the agenda, I can't find anyone south of the one so I'm frightening to say, please give me a parish in Pitsy, Basford, never made that give I just don't see the urgent call for anything south of the one two seven. So, if Whitford wants a town council, fine, but south of the one two seven, I just don't see the appetite. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, uh, Councillor Smith. Councillor Brockman. Hi. Um, well, as an elected member, when I got elected, I got elected to, to represent all the people in Whitford and Whitford, basically. And I just feel that I've got to speak up about this because although I agree with your idea of a town council in Whitford, at the moment, because of COVID and all the other things, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to lose their jobs. Um, Money is going to be tight for them. They've got to find bills, you know, an extra money for a free set. At this time, will put a lot of strain on people's finances. Um, there are fantastic groups in the area, like the One Ball and the people doing the park, and all that, and they can get money through grants, through fundraising, and everything, and they can really go forward and get a lot done in the town. So at the moment, I really don't think it fair that the residents have to pay extra prefects at this moment. You know, it, until this country gets back on its feet financially and everyone can go forward. So I just thought I'd better stick up for the people of the world and of Whitford in this respect. Thank you. I'm asking you to pull it back a bit. Okay, thank, thank you, uh, Councillor Brockman. Uh, 
before I, I respond to some of the points that have been raised, is any other councillor, Councillor McGowan? I have been waving for about the last half hour. Sorry, I can't see you on all the screens. Oh, yeah, well, not seeing me is not always a bad thing. Um, what I would say is um, there's a certain degree of irony going on tonight because uh, at my last external affairs committee meeting, despite the fact the Conservatives had attacked us and attacked us and attacked us, for the fact that we were delaying, allegedly, the Whitford Town Council. One of the councillors on that committee said, because of COVID-19, perhaps we should hold it off a bit longer. Um, now, obviously, COVID-19 has an impact on all sorts of things. But I think when it comes to local democracy, we, we have demonstrated we can work in a different way. We can connect with people and our desire, and I'm sure that's true of, of Gavin as well, is to get Wickford Town Council in place as soon as possible, which we've been accused of frustrating, which is not the case. Now, when it comes to other parish councils, it's a simple issue. If the people want them, we will deliver them. If they don't, we won't. It's not complicated not difficult, it's simple. So if you're against delivering democracy on a local level, fine. But what we're saying is we will consult, and if that is the opinion, so in Vange and Pitsy, if there is no desire for a form of parish council or whatever you want to call I, I hate the same term parish council, but that's the only one we're allowed to use, so I have to use it. So, you know, if there is no desire for that, we will not do it. How difficult is that? Thank you, uh, Councillor McGarren. I, I just want to, uh, as a point of clarity, um, uh, before I do that, Councillor Brown, do you want to come in? Yeah, I mean, I mean, Aidan's just said a few of the points I wanted to make. I mean, tonight, we are not making a decision that Wickford does or doesn't get a parish council. We are not making a decision that south of the 127, they don't. What we're making a decision on is, do we go and ask people? Do we continue to consult with local residents on what they do or do not want? We're not imposing a precept anywhere. We're not imposing a parish council. We're not doing any of those things. What we are doing is ensuring that, that our residents are asked what they want and ensuring that local democracy has a voice. And I don't think we should be delaying that. I don't think we should be saying to people of Whitford, yes, we're gonna ask you what you want, but anyone that lives south of the 127, we're not gonna ask you. I think it's important that we ask all residents and we consult with all residents. And I'm sure that our officers have the capability to be able to do that. And have demonstrated already they can do that during this COVID process through other consultations that we have had. And therefore, I cannot see the problem. It's quite disheartening that tonight the Conservatives' only policy of anything seems to delay anything that means anybody gets to have a voice or gets to say or gets to make a decision. It's quite disappointing. Thank you, uh, Councillor Brown. I, I, I have to say as well, just going back to Councillor Sullivan's point, I, I, it, it strikes me as a bit of a, a, a contradiction in terms for us to say we want to press ahead with the public consultation for Wickford because we want that to happen but we can't do any other consultation because of coronavirus uh, and and that to me seems a, a bit of, a, of a, a contradiction in terms we either delay everything because of coronavirus and the conservatives have have spoken tonight in favor of delay uh, and if that is what we are to do then it strikes me that we do that for both recommendations and that we defer the item uh, till to the autumn um, and then we have some more certainty over coronavirus but of course that will impact on the timetable for laying of the order for uh, the Whitford Town Council if they are successful in winning public opinion. Uh, I am also minded that clearly there will be a view from the Whitford Town Council or the shadow Whitford Town Council themselves about whether or not coronavirus may or may not scupper that public support because if, if we come back here in, 
in a couple of months time and there isn't the public support, then we won't lay the order. Uh, and we've been pretty clear about that as well. So I suppose, Councillor Sullivan, I'm, I'm just looking for some, some clarity because as I see what you're suggesting, it's to approve recommendation one, but to delay recommendation two, which would be um, uh, slightly contradictory, as I say. So could you just be clear for the committee what your proposal is? So as a uh, go ahead with recommendation one, Wigford's further down the line, uh, it's already had uh, a lot of engagement and uh, consultation and there's been far too much delay and as was already said that we couldn't, we, you know, it's not even going to be for another two years anyway until it goes ahead. So we really did need to go ahead on it. With regard to the others, um, it's a far greater exercise, it's across a far bigger area, uh, it's asking really uh, a difference well, not different set, but it's, uh, there can be different arrangements for different parishes and, account and local councils and stuff. Um, and I've, I don't think that that exercise okay. should run parallel and that that one should be extended. Okay, I, I understand what you're saying. I, I, I think the, the, it's the point of principle, isn't it, about, about public consultation, whether they are at the final stage or at the first hurdle, uh, there is the question about public consultation, both need a public consultation. So if the issue is that there is a barrier to public consultation that is presented by coronavirus, as you see it, then to me, there isn't a difference to what stage a particular proposal is at. I just want clarity from you as to what it is we're voting on. Are we voting on a contradiction or are we voting on a consistent recommendation? What is it that you're after? Well, I don't believe that the Wickford um, uh, exercise should go ahead in in conjunction with the governance review anyway, it should, should already be further down the line. So, as I said, we go ahead with recommendation one and a recommendation two be extended uh, for an additional couple of months beyond uh, what's proposed uh, so that we get a far better representation, I think, for those okay. areas. I, I, I do hear what you're saying. I, I don't think this is a question of whether they go out at the same time or they go out uh, a week in, uh, whatever it, it is about whether or not coronavirus is, is preventing the public, as you see it, from engaging in the consultation. And it would appear that what you're asking is for us to put a different perspective on recommendation one to recommendation two. Councillor Baggett is in the council. I'll come to him now, because I'm sure what he's gonna tell is that he wants to wait for the government white paper on devolution. No, I just think that you're, you're, you're somehow uh, either being obtuse or, or just missing the point. Um, what we're actually saying is that Recommendation one is absolutely fine because where it's at. And we have no problem with the governance review uh, in other areas, but what we're saying is get it right and extend the consultation. What have you got to hide by actually taking longer to consult to make sure that more people uh, are able to respond? I mean, we've seen with the town centre consultation, which has been a car crash for you guys, uh, as far as, as what it's done. And there seems to be a lot of, a lot of pushing things through and trying to get them all done on the hurry up because they're, they're unsound ideas. Well, this is something that uh, I've got absolute faith in, in Mr. Birkinshaw on. And, and all we're saying is that, that progress with it, but give the public a longer period of time to take into account that some people may not be able to respond uh, at, at the same level that they would have done in normal circumstance. I mean, that's pretty simple. To use Councillor McGurran's expression, I don't understand what you're not getting with that. Yeah. I, I, I think we are, in essence, being asked to vote on a contradiction. We're saying that because Wickford is at the final stage, coronavirus impact on consultation doesn't matter. Uh, because the governance review is at the first stage, coronavirus impact on consultation does matter. Um, uh, nonetheless, that's the, the, the contradiction that we uh, have uh, on the table to uh, amend the recommendations that are set out by Councillor Sullivan. Councillor Sullivan, do you have a seconder? for your uh, contradiction amendment? I second the non-contradictory amendment. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna put that to the vote. Can I ask all committee members to unmute themselves? Uh, I will kick things off. I will vote against uh, the amendment. Councillor Smith. Uh, I think I'll vote against if I followed the opposition right today. <laughs> Councillor Brown. Against. Councillor McGurran. Having given it incredibly careful consideration against. Councillor Bagger. Obviously for. Councillor Sullivan. For. Councillor Buckley. 
like Councillor McGowan, given it eminent consideration, and I'm for. Very good. The vote is lost. Uh, therefore, we come to the recommendations as they are set. Out. I think Paul Birkinshaw indicated to speak. Oh, sorry, I can't see everyone. Mr. Birkinshaw. And then Councillor Harrison. Sorry, Chairman, just to make the point, I think, on recommendation two, you know, we're not, I think we're kind of jumping ahead a bit in terms of deliberating perhaps on whether consultation is appropriate. What I'm asking in recommendation two is do you wish for proposals to come forward to, to start to shape and see what they may, may look like? And I think at that point, it may be more appropriate to consider whether consultation should then take place or be held. We're not talking about doing that. We're, we're uh, just asking for an indication as to whether some proposals should come back for further consideration, not approving things to go out as basis for consultation with regards to the south of the borough. It's do you yeah. just want a further report regarding that? You can then think about appropriateness, how consultation might be done, what the barriers might be, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I think we're just jumping ahead really in terms of judging whether consultation might be appropriate when you don't actually have any proposals before yeah. you with regards to the south of the borough. Uh, and that pertinent final point was not lost on me. Councillor Harrison. Oh, Mr. Birkinshaw has just answered my question because I think I was the only one only person probably reading it and understanding what it meant. And on that note, uh, Chairman, we will can move... I just clarify for Mr. Birkinshaw whether if we vote for on uh, the second part of the recommendation, that, that would include pity. Yes, I mean, I apologise, unless the committee tells me otherwise, and that's probably what I see direction on. I, sorry, I, I struggled to, I'm not clear on the reference you refer to in the report, but if it was missed out, then I don't think that was intentional, so I apologise for that. But what I'm seeking is some direction, so the committee may say, well, yeah, bring it, think about the whole of the south of the 127, or um, just think about a certain part of it and not others, but... Um, any, any steer would be helpful, but I suggest at this point, happy to look right across um, and bring forward proposals that you know may then be ruled in or out or favoured or not. Okay, uh, so that said then, uh, recommendation two is not to consult on anything because we don't have anything uh, to consult on uh, at this stage. Uh, and therefore, uh, this is to mandate officers uh, to do uh, a piece of work uh, on uh, the South uh, and the various parts, and of course we did get some. You know, Langdon Park uh, Residents Association up at Radford, uh, or Radford Avenue, uh, did come back and 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 say that there was a, an interest there as well. So uh, clearly there is a basis uh, for us to, to look at um, as well. I'm going to move to the vote because the recommendations are, are one and two. I am going to take them uh, on block, uh, and so I ask members to unmute themselves from the committee. Uh, Councillor Smith. Councillor Smith? Paul. Councillor Brown? In favour. Councillor McGarren? In favour. But Councillor Baggett? In worst news, Liverpool have just taken the lead against Chelsea. Very now, good. I'm not Council Councillor Baggett? Chelsea, but I'm just saying. Councillor Baggett? Um, in regard to recommendation one, in favour, and, in, and including Pitsy in recommendation two, in favour. Councillor Sullivan? Or Councillor Buckley? And I vote in favour as well. So the uh, recommendations uh, are carried uh, unanimously. Thank you uh, to members for that. Uh, we are now at uh, agenda item seven, uh, which are the budget guidelines uh, and the uh, revised uh, MTFS. Uh, members uh, will see uh, a schedule uh, in this in terms of the impact of COVID-19 and the pandemic uh, on the council and the council's uh, finances, the impact in terms of loss of, of income, as well as uh, the cost of expenditure, uh, currently stands at 4.7 million uh, to uh, the council. Uh, and to date, we've, we've had the final third round of tranche of government funding, uh, and it's just over 2 million that the government had given back. So there is still uh, a substantial loss of uh, council finances uh, as part of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, Mr. Larkman, the Deputy 151, uh, is on the line, I believe. There he is. Yes, I'm here. Uh, there he is. Um, I will hand over to you uh, to present the report, and then I'll open it up to questions from members. Mr. Larkman. Uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, as uh, Councillor Callan just said, uh, this provides members with uh, an update on the 10-year 
MGFS. Um, it also sets out the proposed budget timetable for committee approval. Uh, and it also uh, presents an updated uh, fees and charges scheme uh, for officers to use when uh, determining levels of fees and charges. Um, in respect of the uh, MTFS, as uh, Councillor Callan has just said, um, I guess the most significant part of that is, is the, an update on the uh, current position as we see it on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I would just like to make the point that, that this is changing all the time. So. Um, since the report was published, we've had confirmation of £170,000 worth of new burdens funding in um, respect of the work that was done on issuing um, over £30 million worth of grants to local businesses. And we've also had confirmation of a, a share of the £500 million that was announced, I think that was two weeks ago, uh, which is the third sort of like general support for councils of which we're receiving uh, I can't remember whether it's 360 or 370,000, but a, a figure round about that. Uh, we're still waiting details on the uh, scheme that was announced to uh, compensate councils for uh, loss of income. Uh, we don't have any details on that. Um, also, just to mention that the uh, Chancellor uh, today announced, uh, launched the comprehensive spending review. Um, so we'll see what the outcome is there. You've probably all seen the reports in the press and read his statement, so you can make your own judgments as to uh, the direction that that might take us in. And also, um, information is still a little bit sketchy about um, what will happen to RSG, new homes bonus, uh, business rate schemes, um, etc. Um, though I did do note today that the uh, Treasury has issued a call for evidence on the fundamental review um, of business rates, which is not directly linked to our funding, um, but it is an important part of how the business rates um, system might be uh, uh, reformed in, in the future. Um, the process from a uh, member's perspective in terms of bringing reports to uh, the various committees is is largely unchanged, so we'll be bringing budgets to service committees in, in the autumn. PNR will consider the overall budget uh, in January, and then the uh, final budget will go uh, to um, Council on the 25th of February. Um, we uh, have um, provided slots for technical briefings for members or budget workshops, depending on, on what members want to do uh, in that respect. Um, so uh, I think I'll just stop there and I'm happy to take any questions. Right, thank you, uh, Mr. Larkman. And yes, just to uh, confirm that the budget timetable uh, that is uh, set out, um, each individual service committee uh, will go through um, the draft budgets as usual, and there will be uh, all member briefings. And of course, it would be beneficial if uh, group leaders who are on the call could also advise their uh, groups about those uh, all member briefings, uh, which will be taking place. Uh, throughout the autumn and into early new year as well. Uh, we will then look to set the budget on the 25th of February um, after this committee has considered the draft budget. Does any member have any uh, points that they wish to raise in relation to um, the timetable for setting of the budget or the MTFS? If you do, you can feel free to wave at me. Councillor Sullivan, your hand is up on my list. I don't know if that is old or new. Uh, no, I've, I've, I've just uh, put the hand up. Um, sorry, can I just yeah, go get on. to the uh, where I was looking at? Right, so, um, yeah, thank you, um, Mr. Lockman, for the update there. I was, was going to ask, could we have some update? Because I know the funding um, announcements had happened since the uh, publication of this agenda. Uh, so uh, glad to hear um, that the government is um, still helping fund the council. Um, with regard to um, the medium term financial strategy and um, on page 167, so you've got all of the, um, the approach on how we're gonna address the budget gap. Um, this, these are the budget guidelines, aren't they? These are the budget guidelines that Um, yes. That you're, you're going, yeah. So I think, you know, we could we could agree with most of them, um, you know, generate new ideas for delivering efficiency, review rationalising council assets, etc. Um, I think they're pretty generic. Uh, one of them, though, um, is 
maximizing income gener generating opportunities through the delivery of the town center master plan. Well, um, I think we've made it pretty clear uh, conservative group is uh, fundamentally against a lot of the uh, proposals within that town center master plan. Um, I think at the moment, and we're gonna have further discussions later on the agenda, is not the time to uh, get uh, further involved in the property market. Um, and I think that we should, um, well, at least hold that process and also stop paying consultants with regard to the uh, town centre master plan and uh, just stop continue to accrue, um, you know, uh, any borrowing costs, etc. Um, and we could also add um, one or two other uh, items to the um, proposed policies we could do there, such as, um, you know, um, halting any further member investments, um, which is something that I mentioned at a previous meeting. Um, so I would say that um, we would not be able to um, agree with the approving of the budget guidelines because, uh, as I've just mentioned, uh, there's an element in it that I don't think that uh, we could support. So uh, I would be against that, and I know that you know the ten-year financial forecast is just for noting. Thank you, uh, Councillor uh, Sullivan. Um, I, I know that uh, no Conservative Council would want to predetermine themselves from any uh, planning application that may or may not come forward in relation to the uh, town centre uh, master plan. So, a uh, general reminder uh, for everyone uh, to be slightly careful uh, with their language on that. But of course, um, there are commercial opportunities that do exist uh, in the town centre when it comes to things like district heating networks and some of the other uh, things that we discussed at the uh, commercial subcommittee uh, of this uh, committee uh, just a few uh, weeks ago. Are there any other, and of course, uh, by the way, on the point that you raised, perfectly legitimate point about member investments and all the rest of it, there are uh, service committee meetings where uh, there is the opportunity for you to do that. And I know that um, there have been proposals put uh, at the service committee since we last spoke uh, about the um, uh, the outturn report that we had uh, previously. There's been committee meetings where um, proposals have been looked at in relation to uh, member investments that were in the uh, budget passed in February. So there'll be more opportunities as we move through the autumn uh, for members to do that. Uh, are there any other further questions uh, on uh, this report? Uh, I'm not. Uh, seeing any uh, member of the committee uh, indicating there are, oh, sorry, Councillor Baggett has a blue hand. Councillor Baggett, there you go. Uh, thank you. Um, actually, it's, it's, it's more just to, to um, be absolutely crystal clear, given that you raised it. Um, I know that any single one of the Conservative group, uh, were they to attend any uh, meeting on planning where a decision is required, would go into that room uh, fully open-minded and listen to all the evidence prior to making any form of decision. Absolutely right. Thank you for putting that on the record alongside your opposition. Uh, we're going to move uh, to the vote uh, on the recommendations as set out, one and two uh, at the same time. Thank you. So could, we, Chairman, could we do them separately, please? Uh, um, no, because the second report is just, the second recommendation is noting. Okay. So the, the, the first thank one is the, one the only one is really worthwhile is the first one. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Hartman, uh, for uh, that report. Um, the recommendations then, as set out, recommendation one and two, uh, can I ask members to unmute themselves? Uh, and Councillor Smith, how do you vote? In oh, go again. In favour. Thank you. Councillor Brown. In favour. Councillor McGurran. In favour. Councillor Baggett. Against. Councillor Sullivan. Against. Councillor Buckley. Against. Say that again. Against. Sorry, I'll move yeah. nearer to the screen for next time. No worries. Uh, and I vote uh, in favour. So the recommendations uh, are passed. Uh, thank you again uh, to Mr. Lartman uh, for that. Uh, agenda item eight uh, is the investment lending uh, strategy. This is uh, a recommendation that has come uh, to us from the Commercialisation and Future Finance Subcommittee that met uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, and looked at this with a presentation uh, from CBRE, uh, who we are also asked tonight uh, to uh, appoint as our investment lending uh, advisors. 
Um, on this, uh, before I bring Mr. Larkman in and then open up to questions, um, clearly we, we will hear uh, later on uh, this evening uh, in the uh, uh, item I asked for um, uh, a kind of a, an update, a verbal update on the PWLB uh, government consultation update, more of a technical uh, update, I grant you, but it will have an impact uh, on what we are doing. Um, DTZ, uh, we know, have been advising of a struggling market uh, when it comes to uh, PWLB and borrowing more generally. Um, as a council, we have looked at leasing uh, and we have uh, engaged uh, in uh, a strategy for leasing. Uh, and what we are seeking to do here is uh, add a third uh, string to the bow, if you like, uh, by adding lending uh, as an option, uh, which was endorsed at the uh, commercialization uh, subcommittee. Mr. Lartman, um, I don't know if you wish to uh, say anything specifically uh, about the report, uh, and then I'll move to questions. Mr. Larkman. Uh, no, because you've just almost read my introduction word for word, so um, I have nothing to add. Never let it be said that this is not a member-led council. There we go. Uh, in which case, uh, let's open this up then to um, the uh, questions. I'm looking at the hands. I've got Councillor Sullivan waving. Is that the case? Yep, Councillor Sullivan and Councillor Buckley. Right, thanks, Chairman. Um, now, had this been coming to the committee 18 months ago or uh, when we were in administration, it could well have been something that we would um, consider. Um, I believe, though, and as I alluded to a minute ago in the last agenda item, now is the wrong time to invest in or give loans against anything secured against property. Um, to Just to give you an example, um, I work for an asset management company. We have two property funds, and for the last four months, we have suspended dealing in those funds, um, so you can't buy or sell units in them. And the reason is because we are unable to accurately calculate the value of the underlying property assets that those funds hold. And therefore, it wouldn't be appropriate for you to buy or sell any units in them because you couldn't genuinely know how much those assets are worth. Um, now, of course, this is a strategy and uh, you could say, well, let's just agree the strategy and then we can, um, you know, uh, wait until it's a bit it's a bit clearer things calm down and then we could implement it i would even say that it's this is not the point where we could uh, create a strategy um for instance you've you've got uh, in the agenda that uh, one of the things we'd be looking at would be offices investing in office or sorry uh loans that are held against offices um so if you recall back in january uh, when we had the update uh, with regard to our um uh, investments that I I questioned with consultants why it was they were so keen on office properties at the time because in my opinion the way I could see things going that we were going to more flexible working and there'd be less need for office space in the long term but they assured us at the time they thought that that was a sound investment now I can't say that I predicted the pandemic, but I think that what has happened in the last few months has probably accelerated the trend that was happening in um, flexible working and therefore uh, reducing the uh, requirement for office space uh, by five years. So until at such time as things come a bit clearer with regard to how uh, not just the property market, but society in general, uh, has sorted itself out and come out of this uh, whole situation. I don't think we could even um, discuss or agree a strategy on it because we don't know what the strategy is going to be based on. I'll give you another example. Before the 2008 uh, financial crisis, uh, Tesco, one pound in every eight in the high street used to be spent in Tesco. After the financial crisis, people changed their shopping habits and now Aldi and Lidl are the ones in the ascendancy. There was a fundamental change in the, in people's habits and behaviour. And I believe that th that is something that will happen after that. But the trouble is, we don't know what those fundamental changes will be. So in a nutshell, now is not the time to expose the council to more property-based risk. Um, I don't believe that we're in a position where we could agree a strategy. Um, 
I know that you uh, said in the, the last item, all, all, we, all we're planning to do is just defer everything. Well, I'm sorry to sound repetitious, but I, I believe in this instance, this is something that we should defer for a year, up to a year before we're in a position to really know what we need to do uh, or what we can do or what would be appropriate for the council. Um, so that would be my proposal. Um, I'll, I will let others speak first, but uh, my proposal, Chairman, uh, is that we would uh, defer this, this consideration for a year. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Sullivan. Councillor Buckley. Again, if Councillor Sullivan's proposal needs a second, or I'll formally second that. Um, I, I did just want to make a couple of points on this, and uh, like Councillor Sullivan, I, I think the risks at this time are too high. At the end of the day, it is not our money we're dealing with, it's the public's money. Whether we borrow it and aim to repay it, or however it's funded, um, it is the public's money or we are accountable to the public for it. In effect, what you're actually asking the council to do here is to act like a bank. And you've got to look at the way the banks have performed over the last few years to see the level of risk. You could borrow money cheaply, presumably from the PWRD, and lend it relatively expensively. Now go and look at the number of commercial companies that are going into CVAs, um, voluntary administrations. Yeah, the, the risks at this current time are, in my opinion, far too high for us to be doing. Like Councillor Sullivan, in better economic times, I would probably say there are opportunities there if we are careful about it. One thing I wanted to mention, um, you've quite rightly spoken about housing many times um, in the past. And have you actually thought about whether we could follow the example of uh, Ken Livingston in the days when he ran the GLC and look at mortgages for the first time buyers that can't borrow to buy in our borough? The risk on those would probably be far less than the risk you're asking the council to take at the moment. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Buckley. Yes is definitely the answer to that final point. Uh, I've been pushing that for about six years. Um, so I 100% uh, agree, uh, agree with that. Um, I will answer uh, some of the questions and then speak to the uh, amendment in a moment that Councillor McGurran had indicated. Sorry, I'm trying to unmute myself unsuccessfully. Um, yeah. I just find this a bit weird, really. You know, let's, you know, it's not that difficult, is it? We have a challenging time ahead of us. So let's really be ambitious. Yeah. Because for the last 10, 15 years, there has been an absolute lack of ambition. And weirdly, what the COVID-19 pandemic has done has given us an opportunity. Now, you can either grasp that opportunity or you can walk away from it. But if you walk away from it, our town centre and our borough will die. So it's that simple. Thank you, uh, Councillor McGowan. I, I, I think we need to come back as well to the point that what we're doing here tonight is uh, we are endorsing a strategy uh, that was um, unanimously endorsed and recommended to this committee just weeks ago by the subcommittee, including Councillor Baggett uh, and Councillor Rimmer. Uh, this strategy does not uh, get the council into any arrangements at all with anybody. Uh, we are simply creating uh, tools in the bag, if you like, for perhaps in two, three years time, if the council decides that they want to uh, do something, then the option is available. If the economy, who knows what will happen with the economy, but if it does make a, a V-shaped recovery, as some people uh, are perhaps optimistically suggesting on the other side of the Atlantic, who may or may not live in 1400 Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, then that would be uh, an opportunity for the council to, to strike. So I come back to it, um, the, uh, the strategy, uh, was unanimously sent to this committee uh, by uh, the commercial subcommittee. 
uh, Councillor Baggett, Councillor Rimmer, uh, just a few weeks ago uh, sent it here. We are not looking at investing in uh, any particular item here. That is not what we are uh, doing with this uh, report tonight. We are merely mandating officers and the committee uh, to be able to look at this in some detail. Uh, I'm going to bring Councillor Baggett and then Councillor Harrison in. Thank you, Chairman. I do indicate, but somehow it's just, just not seen. I know how difficult it is on the screen, so that's not a criticism. Uh, and neither is what I'm about to say. And I'm, I'm actually, uh, I'd be very interested in what Councillor Harrison has to say uh, on this. I think the thing is that when we're looking at any form of commerciality and, and moving a council forwards, it does involve looking at um, new ways of thinking, new opportunities, uh, and uh, what there is out there uh, from uh, what we've normally looked at in traditional council models in the past. Where I think there's, there's, there's a flaw in the process though, and, and you've alluded it to, to it yourself, on a really important decision like this, taking it to a subcommittee for people to get a full presentation, ask challenging questions and come to a decision, and then not give the same presentation and the same opportunity of challenge to the members on this committee is a bit of a, a, a flawed process. Uh, and I think that when it does come to things that are fundamentally important to the council, like strategies and things like that, maybe we just need to consider that, uh, does it really need to go to a subcommittee first to then come to a committee with different members on it? Um, I actually was very satisfied and uh, with um, what was said and the level of challenge provided and the answers that we got back, some of which were of a, a, a quite a technical and detailed nature at the subcommittee meeting. But of course, I um, am not a um, consultant on leasing of properties and, and my ability to disseminate that same level of uh, information and ask and answer different questions uh, to, to members that are on this committee from my group uh, is, 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 isn't there. Uh, I was genuinely expecting tonight, and, I, and when we were talking about this uh, prior to the meeting, um, I actually thought that we would be getting a similar presentation so that those members that weren't present would have the same level of ability to challenge and be satisfied. So I can understand why um, both Councillor Sullivan and Councillor Buckley are sceptical and have raised the points they have, and quite right they should. So as a learning thing, and, and Councillor Harrison, I, I'd be interested, as I say, I'd be interested in his view, that maybe on things like this, they either come just direct to PNR, or um, the members of PNR are invited to um, participate uh, when it's something of this nature. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Bayer. Councillor Harrison. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I've listened to what Councillor Baggett said, and he has he has some valid points there. But I would like to point out that, and I agree with him, the presentation we were given, and the questioning, which which were uh, questions were well answered. I think you'll agree, uh, Councillor Baggett, and Councillor Rimmer was very questioning in the of the um, group who came to do the presentation. But of course, this is only a strategy. We're not making a decision tonight. And I think there's enough documentation with the agenda explaining the strategy, which if you want, you know, I mean, okay, I've only, I've only got to convince Councillor Brockman, you've got to convince a few more. I understand that, I understand that, but I think it's taking people with you on a strategy. I think the difference is when we come down to dealing with a particular item, which has happened previously, and I, I'm, even before Councillor Callaghan joined this um, subcommittee, I think nearly every decision was unanimous. Even when we, I think, agreed to defer something for, for further information, and I thought it was a very united group of people, which I think made some important decisions on behalf of this council. When we come down to looking at a, a, perhaps a, a, an asset, as a result of this strategy, I think it then comes to a different argument. And the different argument might well be that I'll agree with Councillor Sullivan. But I think the strategy which this council should adopt, I think is a reasonable strategy. We're not asking at this stage, the council to commit to anything, just a strategy. Thank you, Chairman. 
Thank you, Councillor. And I think just before we put the um, recommendation from, or the amendment to the recommendation to a vote from Councillor Sullivan, uh, I, I would just point out that, of course, we have strategies on, on lending uh, and on, on borrowing, sorry. Um, and what nobody is proposing that we that we use that right now because of the current situation that we're in. And if you go and buy uh, retail real estate, because of course, um, if you were going to buy uh, that, it would be a very sound investment at this moment in time. And so we understand that. Uh, when it comes to borrowing and, and the, the stuff that's there. But we still have that in our armour so that when the economy improves, we'll be in a position to act. And, you know, I know he doesn't want to be repeating his line that he's kicking everything into the long grass, stopping everything, deferring everything. But sadly, that is the case. And, and what we here in the administration are trying to do is to put the council on the front foot uh, and be in a position to react positively uh, when the uh, economy uh, improves. But... Uh, I take the point. I am going to move to the vote on the um, uh, on the amendment to defer this for 12 months uh, that has been tabled by Councillor Sullivan, seconded by Councillor Buckley. Can I ask all members to uh, unmute themselves uh, as voting members? I'll kick this off. Uh, I will vote against the amendment. Councillor Smith? Against. Councillor Brown? Against. Councillor McGurran? Uh, Councillor McGurran, you dropped off. Okay, Councillor uh, Baggett. Abstain. Councillor Sullivan. Oh. Councillor Buckley. Oh. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Councillor uh, McGurran uh, will be marked as absent for that vote. Uh, in which case, I'm going to put the recommendations uh, to the vote. Uh, and take them uh, uh, as one and two uh, on block. Uh, I will kick things off and vote in favour. Councillor Smith? Oh! Councillor Brown? Oh! Councillor McGurran? Councillor Baggett? Oh! Councillor Sullivan? Against. Councillor Buckley? Against. Thank you. Happy families, isn't it? Uh, the recommendations are carried. Um, I'm going to adjourn uh, the meeting uh, until quarter past nine uh, for members to take a comfort break and for the chief executive to determine whether or not West Brom are in the Premier League. So let's uh, adjourn uh, until quarter past. Thank you.
Are we all back? Mm -hmm. How long's left, Scott? Five minutes. <laughs> We're still live on YouTube, by the way, if you're looking at it. <laughs> All those West Brom fans. Plus 10 minutes stoppage time. Yeah, that's true, yeah. It's two all. Talk about leave it to... Uh... Gavin? Yeah. We, you know we're live on YouTube still. I know, I know. I'm, I'm sure that there's Baggies fans all over uh, tuned in to watch our proceedings. Um, let me just uh, check where we are. This is complicated to do this with all these screens. Uh, Council Brown, is she back? I think I can see everybody bar Councillor Brown. Okay, all right, well, we'll make a start because the next uh, item that we've got on the agenda um, is an operational deployment of aerial drones for planning enforcement. And this, of course, went to neighbourhoods and public spaces uh, last night uh, and was carried uh, unanimously uh, by members. I don't know if Councillor Harrison wishes to say anything uh, about this uh, report at this point. Councillor Harrison. Sorry. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, uh, it went to my committee last night. It was unanimously approved. I think that Councillor Buckley will probably back me up in how we dealt with it. We're using Thurrock um, drones. They're fully licensed and we've covered the GDPR aspect. And last night was in effect to uh, change the regulatory which was required. Um, there's a lot of detail to it and uh, it went through very well last night. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't know if uh, we have, uh, oh, Councillor Buckley's waving, do you want to come in? Chairman, yeah. um, just really to endorse what uh, Councillor Harrison has said, um, I think all of us recognise the challenges of uh, planning enforcement in particular and uh, in, particular in the Greenbelt areas where um, access is sometimes, shall we say, difficult. And um, working with Tharak, it is for a six month trial period. Um, I actually think that this, this is an opportunity for us to find out. A, whether it will actually work as well as we would hope it will work, and B, will deliver results that can't be delivered without putting our own officers um, or other people at risk. And I think you know, it's a welcome proposal. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any officer on who wishes to say anything uh, about this? I'm just flicking through. I don't think there's uh, any, unless any member has a, oh, sorry, can't, uh, Mr. Birkinshaw. Yes, Chairman, just to clarify in terms of the item, it was listed on, on the agenda for this committee because it was, um, as it was being developed, it was intended that perhaps a corporate policy for the use of aerial drones would uh, be coming forward, which would cut across the remit of all committees and therefore be a matter for PNR. But uh, as it transpired, it was uh, at this point just a pilot for planning enforcement only, and hence the reason why it went to neighbourhoods and public spaces. So uh, to a degree being removed from this agenda, uh, but I think just to note that it is intended uh, to learn from the pilot, as uh, Councillor Harrison Buckley have said, uh, the view to developing a corporate policy in terms of how the use of aerial drones can support not just planning enforcement, but perhaps other services of the council and therefore a, a policy maker and forward to policy and resources committee in um, six months or so, but no, no issues for this committee this evening. Thank you. Uh, in which case, uh, we will um, move on to agenda item 10, uh, which is Gibraltar Feasibility Report uh, and Next Steps. Uh, as noted in the declarations of interest, we uh, as members of the committee uh, have been lobbied uh, on this uh, report. Uh, and in a moment, I'll bring in uh, Tom Ash to uh, introduce the report um, uh, and to uh, merely say that no decision is being taken this evening uh, any decision that does uh, need to be taken in respect of disposal of land uh, would come back to this committee 
uh, again after the summer break. So uh, there is no decision being taken this evening on disposal. It's just a, a decision on whether or not uh, that we uh, go forward with the marketing of the site uh, around, as the recommendation to suggests, the uh, leisure and hospitality use or the retirement care home use. Uh, I'll hand over to Tom Ashen, and I know that we have uh, some ward members uh, who uh, wish uh, to speak on this item. So, Tomesh, if I hand over to you. Um, I'll just run through the uh, initial... Oh, Matt, initial sorry. Yeah. Cool. It's all right, okay. Chair. I was just going to say, um, Matt will be uh, providing a presentation and we'll be doing a double act on the questions. Okay, thank you. And it looks like Jesus of Nazareth, that is Councillor Jeffrey, wants to come in there. Just Matt. check that you're okay, that you can see my uh, screen yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I just thought it was worth, I'll just pick out the um, key points from the presentation. I think um, it's just worth starting. I know this site has been in front of uh, this committee on a couple of occasions, so I thought it's just worth uh, a bit of context. So a report was brought to Cabinet in September 2016 to set out proposals for the next phase of regeneration in the Whitford Town Centre. Uh, the phase two regeneration strategy has identified Gibraltar Walk as a key opportunity to provide a development that could boost the town centre with a, a view to exploring hotel and leisure based development opportunities on that site. Uh, later, uh, in January 2018, approval was granted to dispose of the land at Gibraltar Walk to bring forward a food and beverage and hotel offer um, in Wickford, which was the Marston's opportunity. However, um, in August 2019, the developer announced a national freeze on spending and no longer wished to proceed with that as an opportunity. So a report was then brought to PNR on the 5th of September 2019 to authorise appointment of consultants to review and identify and consider any potential future development options for the site. And that was undertaken by Montague Evans. And the brief uh, also included some uh, initial soft market testing to understand the, the feelings of the market to what, what we were, um, what the emerging uh, potential uses might be. So Montague Evans explored the positive and negative elements of a hotel and pub, a, a care home and retirement uh, opportunity and actually later in the in their process a supermarket as well so what I'll just very quickly do is just highlight um, the pros and cons of just those three options so um, it's all there in the in enclosure one uh, the pub as you can see there it um, could provide additional social value to the area it's um, a relatively small development area uh, with um, sort of I suppose what we're saying is less disruption and shorter timescales for de development and um, it's a use which could help to retain leisure spend in the town. Um, however on the on the cons there's potential for antisocial behaviour obviously and potentially increased traffic to the site. Um, care home or retirement home that's actually we've seen a really good amount of demand as the as the uh, report shows from um, operators some really good operators on that um, the, I think the location itself would create a good quality environment and um, could potentially enable family housing to be released within the town and actually it would be a quieter use with uh, less infrastructure impact uh, however on the downsides potentially potentially a lower land value than a food store but on a par with a public house or hotel. Um, final option is a supermarket. Um, this could potentially provide the largest land receipt. Um, it gives another food option uh, for residents. However, close proximity to co-op could damage um, that particular um, chain. And also, uh, I think the main thing here is the, is the potential infrastructure problem. So uh, this could in increase congestion in the area, the road network might not be able to cope, particularly the, um, the roundabout, and that in itself could have a negative impact on local residents. Uh, we've just said uh, co-op and Audi are already in the town, so it's just whether an, addi an additional budget operator would provide an oversupply. So from the soft market testing, findings suggested that a retirement or care home had the most demand and would be an appropriate use for the site. Um, a number of operators were very interested in this. Um, what we've actually done is um, this was undertaken, uh, this exercise was undertaken before the COVID period. Um, 
Montague Evans have just kept in touch with those operators during that period. Um, in fact, they've uh, contacted a number of them earlier this week, um, and they are still they are still keen. They are still keen for this opportunity to come forward. So there is there is a demand there. Um, it's considered that the use of land for provision of a retirement care home would be appropriate. It's considered that there would be benefit in the site possibly being used for provision of a pub restaurant, as was originally planned for the site or other leisure or hospitality uses. So um, what we'd like to do is extend Montague Evans appointment to continue through to the marketing and tender phase due to their existing knowledge and the relationships that they've now really important relationships that they've now developed with potential bidders and operators in respect of the site. So it's proposed to extend Montague Evans appointment to undertake a marketing process in accordance with any legislative requirements as advised by a solicitor to the council. So final slide, um, it's proposed for the marketing materials to be finalized throughout August um, in preparation to proceed um, uh, with the marketing period in September. Um, the tender period would be around 20 weeks from commencement to exchange of contracts, um, subject to legal confirmation of, of the route. And it's proposed that the tender will consider both price and quality elements. And the details around that will be finalized in liaison with Montague Evans and uh, our legal support in the next stage of this work. So uh, just to flag up again, further more detailed legal advice will also be sought in conjunction with the marketing exercise to ensure that the council were able to have control over the end use as part of the disposal process. And finally, it would be proposed to return to PNR uh, once these next stages have been undertaken with a recommendation for progress. So that's the end. I'll stop sharing my screen and myself and Tomash are available for questions on that. Thank you, uh, Matt, and thank you, uh, Tomash, uh, for the uh, presentation. Uh, I have been uh, informed that Councillor Jeffrey uh, wishes to uh, speak on this item. So, uh, Councillor Jeffrey, if you would like to address the committee. Thank you, Chairman. Um, firstly, I'd like to begin by thanking officers for presenting this report. But I must put on the record uh, my disappointment to see that this is here again and to see this Labour administration continu continuing to push the sale and marketing of this land. Uh, despite the local opposition from groups such as Whitford SOS, for which I have been lobbied as well. And part of this is sort of the, the major implications that this would have, particularly on traffic in the area and the local environment. So this is uh, adjacent to one of the main three junctions on the WIC, um, and it also acts as a key gateway to the town centre. So as, as the council continues to push ahead with this, uh, sale against the wishes of residents in this respect. It also fails to recognise that green spaces are important for residents' wellbeing <clears throat> and local wildlife. So um, I, I've seen in the report that it says about uh, this development would not result in a net loss of open space overall. So if this land is to be developed, uh, any suitable replacement land has not been put forward in the borough north of the town of Wickford in the September 2017 local green space report. <clears throat> Even in officers' own words, they say that in any forthcoming report about this particular bit of land, um, it would have to include details of mitigating the loss of green open space. So considering this, uh, considering that if it does go ahead with the marketing and then if the administration continues to do it and then sell it, <clears throat> any extra green space to compensate the residents of Wickford couldn't actually really be achieved until we review the local plan in about five years time. So the residents of Wickford, if this was to go ahead, would see a clear and apparent decrease in the amount of green space in their town, essentially removing what we most residents nearby would consider a green buffer, uh, which I believe is unacceptable. Now, I've, I've sort of seen from some press releases that councillors believe we have gained 21 or so acres uh, to the Whitford Memorial Park as an extension. So I've seen an FOY that contradicts this 
and shows that some members are indulging in what we would call uh, smoke and mirrors. So, as this land is designated HC5, with a clear presumption against development, whilst we are not discussing here the principle of planning precedents, I fear that if we let this open space continue to be marketed and then sold, and subsequently given planning permission, this will make other green spaces vulnerable, especially the Whit Country Park and Cranfield Park Road Park, and more broadly, other cherished green spaces across Wickford. Furthermore, a point that needs to be considered in more detail is traffic. This junction is one of the three that leads off of the week and at peak times this will lead to more traffic, longer waiting times and an even more congested cart roundabout and more pollution. So as, as some members will know, there is a suggestion of a 88 room 334 three, hotel for this site. Again, I believe this to be inappropriate. The council should be seeking to protect uh, public open spaces, not taking them away, especially within the context of recent events. Even in the feasibility report itself, Mr Chairman, it says quite clearly that there are infrastructure problems, and as the officer said as well, but it seems to be that the officer, the administration seems to think it knows better. So the report states, with additional highways congestion along Southport Crescent and Redwood Avenue, the road net network may not be able to accommodate or cope with the extra levels of traffic, a serious negative impact for local residents. So what does this mean? So I'm, I'm urging the committee to reject the recommendations and instead seek to protect this land for future generations and put an end to the constant fear of development that residents experience any time this agenda finds its way, on this item finds its way onto the committee's agenda. Uh, Further, further, taking further issue with the report, it says um, about rejuvenating or improving the town. The development of our green spaces is just that, and the process of losing green open space is not to be considered as part of this process, but instead detracts away from it. Uh, and we should be seeking to protect and enhance these green spaces, not tear them down and start a three story 88 bed hotel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Jeffrey. I'm going to bring officers in to respond to uh, some of the um, technical and policy points that you, you've asked there. So I'm going to start with Tom Nash. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And uh, thank you, Councillor Jeffrey, for um, your, your points. Um, and I'll try and address and any of that and I don't. I'm sure Matt will be able to add some further detail. But um, just as a general point, um, I've, I've listed three, and if I've missed any, Councillor Jeffrey, please remind me, and I'm happy to oblige and, and fulfil. Uh, first one you mentioned was traffic. Um, I think the starting point for that, with any planning application or whatever use is proposed for this site, um, it would be subject to uh, traffic modelling, um, which would be a requirement of that planning, and whereby all the points that you've referenced there would no doubt be taken into consideration um, and the out, outcome of any feasibility study from any preferred development uh, would, would look at that. I think generally for the uses that have been described, um, I think with the exception of the supermarket, I think particularly the nursing or care home, the likely uh, future traffic generation of that would be reasonably low. Um, but I'm not a traffic highway engineer expert, so I would leave that to them and their modelling. But that's our, our sort of initial indication from um, our initial uh, e explorations so far. I think the other point that you mentioned was about the green space, uh, open space thereof. Um, I know from looking at the site, it, it is quite challenging. And I think the quality of the open space there is perhaps not the best. Um, I think there would be, uh, again, through the planning application, there would need to be uh, reference to that and I think any development would have to uh, indicate how they would mitigate any loss and how they would enhance that site and how they would provide it in relation to the local plan. I think in particular in respect of public open space HC5 policy um, and I think any sort of financial contribution that would come from the development and the investment thereof could be ploughed back into the town centre and, and assist with the uh, uh, development opportunities thereof. So I think I think there's a number of uh, points there that 
um, we would seek to uh, ensure its maximum mitigation and maximum benefit to the town centre. I don't know if Matt, you would like to add any further points to that. Um, hit the hit the nail on the head actually with with those points, Tomash. Okay, thank you. If there's anything else, Councillor Jeffrey, I'm happy to try and assist. If you don't mind, Chairman, is that okay? No, it's, it's just sort of my concern is that I, I see on the map it says about um, the roads they're not busy roads, but if you if you try to leave the wick at say half eight nine o'clock then lunchtime and then five and six o'clock. They're not light traffic roads. And it's sort of, um, if, if we're sort of selling that and then looking at the broader implications of putting the money into the town centre, surely um, it's not just about the town centre itself, but also how do you access the town centre from the WIC? And it's sort of you know, what would happen there um, and what sort of, because I think that's the right of way, so you can't exactly remove it, but it's just residents have expressed concerns to me that, you know, maybe the priorities aren't quite clear in um, how you would sort of keep this as it is and then focus elsewhere, because I, I, I really can't see, um, if you sell this, you know, it, how, how can we say that that's the town centre when that's, you're going onto a residential estate there. So, I mean, that was just sort of my question. But uh, other than that, no question, Chairman? Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, let me have a look here now at hands. Um, Councillor Buckley. Thank you, Chairman. A number of points, um, some of which Councillor Jeffrey has already made. This particular site has been on the agenda for a very long while and um, I stood down as leader in 2009 and prior to that officers were trying to push the council into selling it. At that time under the cabinet system I had the authority to veto the sale of it and it never even made it to an agenda. Um, under the current system things are I recognise slightly different. Um, this particular site as was rightly mentioned um, is very challenging. Um, I'm not necessarily sure about the stability of the ground because there have been landslips on it. Um, but um, I think from my point of view, I think we had a lucky escape when uh, Marston's decided to withdraw. At the end of the day, this is one of the key entrances to the, to the Wick estate. Any development on that means that you're going between two bricked up developments. That's detrimental to everybody on the WIC development, makes their homes less attractive. Um, in terms of benefits to this town centre, well, I think straight away you could rule out the supermarket because that would potentially damage Aldi and potentially damage um, the co-op, either of which would leave a big hole in the town centre proper. This, in my opinion, as uh, Councillor Jeffrey said, is not the town centre. Area. Um, in terms of uh, th this particular proposal, the strong suggestion seems to be towards a care home, nursing home, um, but they would add virtually nothing to the economic development of the town centre. Um, yes, there would be potential staff spending, but the number of staff and the opportunities they get to go up are very limited in those sorts of uh, businesses, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, I have got a, a proposal to amend the recommendation, which will be um, second in due course. And I'll, I'll give you the recommendation, I'll give you my amendment, and then I'll talk to that if I'm a chairman. Um, recommendation one, we're just noting the feasibility study. So that's, that's fine, there's no problems with noting something. But I delete recommendations two and three and replace them with the following. That the council acknowledges the status of this site as public open space HC5 as defined in the draft local plan and one, withdraws the site from the market and two, investigates measures to protect the site from development in perpetuity, such as village green or similar status. 
And I think that's very clear and unequivocal about what the future of this site could be. Now, just in terms of what it could be, um, you were quite vocal about your ambition to plant a million trees in the borough. And I would suggest to you that this could be a site where actually it would benefit from tree planting because uh, one, it enhances the green aspect, but secondly, it would help to help to keep that land together and uh, reduce the risk of the landslips. Um, it is a green space. It's clearly marked in the local plan. If it were to be replaced somewhere, there is no opportunity to replace it in the vicinity of the current site. Any real any provision would have to be perhaps on phase four of the wick or the far side of the town, not not in the immediate vicinity where residents in that area would uh, benefit from it. And just to make a point on the traffic, um, the works that were undertaken on the um, co-op about a few months ago now, they were, under, they were undertaken to, to try and improve the capacity of that roundabout. It is over capacity now, it was over capacity then, with the continuing development we're going to see in the town, both um, hopefully economic but also residential, that pressure is going to get worse. And of course, it is also an artery from uh, South Woodham, from Runwall, which is using it as a shortcut to either Basildon or to the 127 for other destinations. On the whole, Chairman, um, I understand why you've had to consider it because it's been put in front of you and it is a significant amount of money to turn away. But I would suggest to you that this is not the, the most appropriate site and to withdraw, the, withdraw it from sale would be the most sensible thing to do. You've heard the arguments from um, many members of the public because I've been copied into some of them and I've had many directly. I don't know if you've had all of them, but quite clearly it is not a development which will meet with any support from the local community. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Councillor uh, Buckley. <clears throat> um, before I bring uh, uh, non-committee uh, members in, uh, I do just want to address a couple of the uh, more political uh, points uh, that were that were raised. And, and I also want to put on record my thanks to members of the uh, public and, and the, uh, the WIC in particular, uh, who have been in touch, both people who are uh, against any development on that site, but also uh, large numbers of people who are uh, in favour of development uh, on that site. As well, and I say that I know Councillor Jeffrey uh, as well is is a resident of the WIC, uh, and so we talk to people regularly, uh, uh, neighbours as well as uh, friends on the on the WIC about what they want to see uh, to improve uh, the uh, the site. And there was uh, a widespread support uh, on the WIC for the Marson site when that was uh, proposed. Um, I myself, uh, I'm on record very publicly saying that I supported uh, the Conservative administration back in 2017 when they decided uh, to uh, sell that land uh, and to put a pub and, and a hotel. Uh, I have to say, uh, you know, I understand politics. I understand the Johnny Come Lately uh, arguments of politics. Uh, I didn't see it on a single leaflet uh, in 2018. I haven't seen a single question or a single motion into uh, either Councillor Baggett when he was the leader or myself uh, from Councillor Jeffrey or anybody else uh, in relation to uh, wanting to protect this particular uh, bit of uh, green space. And I would just add, it is not good quality uh, open space at this moment in time. Uh, and we need to be really clear about that. The footpaths uh, are appalling uh, and it is often uh, in a very bad state uh, of repair uh, up there. Uh, and the opportunity to replace uh, that open space with better quality uh, open space uh, I think is something that we should be open-minded to. Uh, I also think that we should be um, upfront and honest uh, that it doesn't necessarily mean if we went down uh, the two routes that are being uh, put forward here uh, in the recommendation, it doesn't necessarily mean that the whole of Gibraltar Walk site would be developed. Uh, and that is something else that we uh, need to consider, that there is obviously always the opportunity for the front facing part of the hill uh, that faces out onto the roundabout to remain uh, as it is but we certainly do and I've had a number of people say this to me during the lockdown period as well we certainly need a better footpath uh, over from the wick uh, into uh, the town centre um, because it's at the moment uh, it is not 
uh, as I say, a particularly uh, good piece of open space. Uh, and there is no doubt that there is improvements uh, that can be made uh, to it. And I agree that down on the front by the uh, roundabout, it could very well be a place uh, where we look to plant uh, trees and we look to, to make the aesthetics as you come up off the roundabout onto the wick uh, more pleasing than Radwinter Avenue, where we've obviously had the land sold as part of the Sporting Village uh, development, which has uh, caused a lot of uh, uproar uh, for residents uh, of uh, the Wick. So I'm not proposing here, or I don't think anyone in the administration is proposing here, that we are doing something drastically uh, uh, different. I think what we're looking to do is to learn from the mistakes of the 2017 Conservative plan, uh, which was uh, obviously backed by uh, lots of people uh, who are sitting uh, on this call uh, with the blue rosettes uh, on, uh, and voted for it, and Councillor Sullivan himself voted for it at, at Cabinet, uh, to put it through uh, as well. We are looking to enhance the entrance onto the WIC, but then to also um, to yield more money in terms of uh, creating something there that is better quality open space. And I think particularly with the option here that we've explored, and we've, been, you know, we've had many uh, reports uh, come to this committee, I'm pleased that eventually uh, one of the, the other Wickford Park councillors has come uh, to our committee because we've had a number of reports on this uh, over the course of the last uh, year or so um, and what we've what we've sought to do I think is to come to a, a a place where we are putting or we are proposing as part of this marketing exercise to put something on that space um, where the public can uh, obviously it's not too intrusive into the into the WIC community but it's also it's in the interest of the facility to also have nice open space around it as well um, so I think that's important. And two other things that I would say is, I think with the kind of um, uh, uses, land uses that are promoted in this report, there is every chance that the council will be able to recover more money in the sale of that land uh, than we did in the previous sale in 2017. And secondly, uh, that money will be ring-fenced money for the regeneration of Wickford Town Centre. Uh, if you cross over that bridge and you walk into a car park, then it, you, you are not walking into nice open space. Uh, if we bring forward the regeneration plans of that car park that we have proposed and that we are, we've put 10 million pounds already into the budget uh, as part of our, our plans to regenerate that car park, you can potentially create open space where people can dwell, where people can linger, people can walk there from the wick. Uh, and I think that that is a positive. Let's not, let's not I understand that there is the differentiation between the residential estate of the Wick and then the town centre. But the town centre, lots of people from the Wick will walk over that bridge into it. It's not a good journey at the moment for them. And it is not a good experience when they get to the other side of that bridge and we shouldn't pretend uh, that it is. Um, I, I have uh, Councillor Brockman uh, who has asked to uh, speak uh, on this issue as well. So Councillor Brockman. Thanks, Chair. Um, well, I've never made a secret of the fact that I support having green space in every town. And I believe that everyone should have access to these green space. I've actually visited that area and stood there. And all I saw was, apart from the fact I couldn't get parked, all I saw was people trundling across, going, as Gavi or Councillor Callahan said, backwards and forwards going to the town or go, commuters going back you know, to the station and everything. So I don't really see it as somewhere where you're going to go over there with a picnic with the kids and have a, a game or whatever, you know. But saying that, sadly, in September 2016, if I get my dates right, the previous administration did decide to sell the land for development. They voted on it. Not us, not, not the administration now. They did it. So they got to take ownership for that one. And then a popular pub and hotel was interested and they pulled out. So now we've got a choice between a care home and a giant supermarket. To my mind, if we've got to have anything at all, which I prefer not, but we've got to have anything, my money's on a care home because the footprint will be smaller and most care homes, well, everyone that I've been to anyway, always has a lot of land where the residents can go and spend time out there, which will keep that keep everyone happy and also it hopefully it won't take that much space 
and there will still be the space left over to keep it all nice and put the trees and everything else. The bottom line is on my phone, I think care home, but the previous administration have got to take ownership for this because if they hadn't have voted for it in September 2016, we wouldn't all be sitting here having this conversation at all, would we? So that's me, but I'm supporting it. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Brockman. Councillor Harrison had indicated. Thank you, Chairman. Let's remind ourselves of the history, shall we? Councillor Brockman's referred to it, you have referred to it. I was hoping that by now Councillor Sullivan would have come into the conversation because he was a member in 2000, September 2016 of the then Conservative Cabinet who unanimously, unanimously carried out the Conservative, Conservatives administration's policy of going out to the market to sell the land at Gibraltar Walk. The only development they didn't want was residential but all other options were on the table. Okay, along came the option for a public house and a hotel. I was opposed to that because on, on highway grounds, I thought that would have been nonsensical on this particular site. Then 2018-19, Councillor Jeffrey beat me, got back on the council, I kept looking for a year, waiting to see the Conservative administration knock this one on the head. But no, no, no. It didn't appear till much later, till much later. When the hotel and um, pub disappeared, well, when it first came about, first of all, there were a lot of people in Whitford in favour of it. And I got abuse then for saying I was against it. So talking for the people of Whitford, as everyone says they are, I don't think you do speak for everybody in Whitford, Councillor Jeffrey. A lot of people were in favour of a public house and a hotel. I think it was the wrong, prop wrong thing to do. Let me be quite clear. The suggestion of a, loud, a large food store on the site should be kicked out immediately, as should residential and any return, in my view, to a pub and a hotel. I'm not a member of this committee, but if I was, I would be moving an amendment to delete leisure and hospi hospitality from recommendation two. Uh, a care home is something I could support, but that would also be dependent on the size, layout and access. In general, care homes do not cause traffic problems. I would put I would point out to the successful care home in South End Road, which does not cause any additional highway problems whatsoever. Councillor Callaghan has already uh, raised the point I was going to mention that if, if the land is sold, the proceeds should be ring, ring fenced toward Whitford regeneration. Let's go on to this uh, anomaly of public open space HC5. I've been hammered on social media. I can't respond to Councillor Jeffrey on social media because he's blocked me, but he's happy to retweet things about me. He's happy to do that, but I can't respond to him because he's blocked me. This piece of land, yes, it is desig designated public open space HC5, and that can be replaced by the 21.5 acres of the former Beauchamp's High School playing field that has just become the council's. It's rather unfortunate that the emerging local plan submitted by your administration, Councillor Jeffrey, inadvertently classed that school field HC5 instead of the correct classification of HC8 as an educational facility space. That was the correct one because it had never ever been HC5. Now Whitford, you talk about not enough open space in Whitford. Whitford is blessed with the Memorial Park, Cranfield Park, the Whit Country Park, Shopgate Park, Nevenden and Elder Avenue Parks, as well as 14 play areas and now an additional 21.5 acres. And you're not happy. You're not happy. Now I find it strange because 
I excuse Councillor Buckley from this because he wasn't a member of the council at any, any time when this was taking place, either the original cabinet decision or the year of conservative administration when they could have changed this. So I can understand his point of view. Uh, Councillor Jeffrey talks wonderfully about the people on the wick. I'm, as you all know, of advanced years. Over 35, 40 years ago, as a member of Basildon District Council, I was chairman of a committee that brought forward the WIC Comprehensive Development Plan. I received tremendous abuse from people in Wickford about building on land. That now houses 3,000 people who are very pleased to be there and be part of Wickford. And to me, I've said this to one or two people, and I'll repeat it here publicly, this piece here to save this place where most people just walk across to get to the town, I find nimbyism at its worst. I really do. Wickford needs regenerating. It's been needed it for many, many years. Different administrations, Labour and Conservative, have failed to do that over the years. And I think that's terrible. That's terrible. We now have a chance. If this land is sold, there's money there to go towards it. There's 10 million pounds we're putting the budget to go towards it. And tomorrow night, hopefully, there's a little bit of an explanation of where we're going forward. And in the coming few weeks, I think the public will see what we want to do to regenerate Wickford. And this, this can be part of it in also allowing us to improve the access from the Wick by having some development on that site. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Harrison. Uh, I agree with every word uh, of, uh, of what you've just said there. Uh, absolutely. Um, Councillor Sullivan, uh, you have indicated to come back. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I mean, I was perfectly willing to uh, <clears throat> let the Wickford councillors um, you know, lead on this item, but uh, um, seeing as history has been dredged up. Um, what I would say is, as um, as we showed on the Sporting Village, which was uh, mentioned you, by you a little while ago, uh, we had to set off various plots of land um, to fund that. Um, and one of them was Kenview Road that we uh, initially intended to set off. Um, but in the end, we did. We listened to the arguments and Kenview Road was um, uh, was not developed and in fact uh, we put additional investment in there because the community came together um, because um, they really wanted to protect that uh, as an asset. So you know we can and have a history of listening to the arguments uh, with regard to uh, developing on plots of land um, that's being used to fund um, investment projects. So I don't think it's inconsistent at all um, back then we voted for it. Um, we've listened to the arguments now that are being put forward and I'll be happy to support Councillor Buckley. Uh, what I would say is that um, when you look at the investment that we have either put in or initiated in Wickford, I'm talking about the swimming pool, uh, the movement at the community centre, uh, getting the Weatherspoons in, um, moving the market, all of these things, investment in Wickford, have been brought forward, initiated by the Conservatives. So um, there is, I don't think uh, that um, putting off the, uh, stopping this development would um, harm or, or prevent us in future from continuing, continuing to invest in Wickford, and it is a priority. But all we're saying is now is it is not essential that we do that. We have listened to the argument and uh, therefore, as I said, I'll, I'll, respond, I'll uh, support Councillor Buckley. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Sullivan. I, I mean, I, I hear what you say about Kempney Road, but, you know, we can go through, can't we? Acacia Park, uh, what a disaster that was. Uh, Markham's Chase, what a disaster that was. Um, th there are a whole range of uh, plots of land all over the borough. It seems to me that whenever it is potentially politically advantageous, i.e. you need to keep hold of Vange going into the 2012 election or you need to try and win Wickford Park back in the uh, next round of elections, suddenly you find your, your morals and your, uh, your, your eth ethical uh, streak. I, I do find it slightly odd, uh, to tell you the truth, but 
Uh, perhaps that's just politics. Uh, Councillor uh, Buckley has uh, an amendment uh, to uh, the recommendation. Can you just uh, repeat that, uh, Councillor Buckley, for us? Yes, certainly, Chairman. Um, recommendation number one stands, which is just to note the findings. Um, and then delete recommendations two and three and replace them with the following. That the council acknowledges the status of this site as public open space HC5 as defined in the draft local plan and one withdraws the site from the market and two investigates measures to protect the site from development in perpetuity such as a village green or similar status. Okay thank you. I'll um, that over if, to if, officers if necessary. Yeah if you can just put that in the chat function for Sarah to, to see that. Oh, I'm not that um, fast to type a tip typist chairman. <laughs> All right, okay, well, you can send you an email afterwards so we get the correct word in for the minutes. Um, do you have a seconder? Seconded. Thank you. Uh, we'll put the uh, amended recommendation uh, to the vote. Can I ask all members to unmute themselves? Uh, I will kick off and vote against the amendment. Uh, Councillor Smith? Against. Councillor Brown? Against. Councillor McGurran? Against. Councillor Baggett? For. Councillor Sullivan. Oh. Councillor Buckley. Say it again. Oh. Okay, thank you. Uh, we, um, uh, the uh, amendment is lost. Uh, so we come to uh, the recommendation uh, one, two, and three. Uh, I will uh, make uh, one slight amendment to recommendation two, uh, which is to remove leisure and hospitality uh, bullet point from uh, recommendation uh, two. Uh, I mean, we can have a vote on uh, on that slight amendment uh, if we uh, so wish. Sarah, I'm looking to you. Do I need to have an amendment? Uh, do I need to have a vote on an amendment to delete that bullet point, or can I just put that straight to the vote? I would I'd go for an amendment on it, as you've already voted. Okay, we'll do. We'll, all right, we'll do an amendment to delete leisure and hospitality. Uh, I'll that be the, that, You'll need a second. I'll second that. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Brown. Can I ask all uh, members to unmute themselves? And we will go round again. I vote in favour of that slight amendment. Councillor Smith? Aye, in favour. Councillor Brown? In favour. Councillor McGurran? In favour. Councillor Baggett? Abstain. Councillor Buck Councillor Sullivan? Sorry. Abstain. Councillor Buckley? Abstain. Thank you. The amendment is passed. We'll come to the recommendations, one, two and three uh, on block. Uh, and again, I will ask uh, members to unmute themselves. I will kick off and vote in favour. Councillor Smith? Over. Councillor Brown? In favour. Councillor McGurran? In favour. Councillor Baggett? Having considered it and given it a lot of thought, against. Councillor Sullivan? Against. Councillor Buckley? Against. Thank you, uh, members. Thank you, Councillor Jeffrey, Councillor Brockman, Councillor Harrison. Thank you to officers uh, as well uh, for uh, your uh, indulgence uh, with that item. Uh, agenda item 11 uh, is a, a verbal update on the COVID impact assessment. Um, not wishing to once again steal the thunder of uh, Mr. Larkman, uh, who has waited patiently um, I believe we've pretty much covered this in the uh, MTFS uh, strategy uh, before with the schedule on the uh, COVID um, uh, impact. Uh, Mr. Larkman, do you have anything you want to add, given you have sat there patiently? Uh, no, that's twice tonight. You've taken the words straight out of my mouth. So thank you. Here we go in tandem. Members, any uh, member wants to uh, ask anything in particular about uh, COVID uh, and about the uh, assessment or are we satisfied? Um, no one is jumping out at me to speak so I'm going to conclude. Councillor Smith wants to come in. Thank you Mr Chairman. Um, there's been some press reports and you've put something on your Twitter the other day about these national reports that Basildon has got the most people back to work. What does that mean in plain layman's terms for people watching it's quite it's quite a positive thing they're saying about Basildon. It, it's uh, the Centre for Cities uh, Research um, uh, have indicated that we have um, the highest number of people returning to their places of work from the survey that they did up until 
uh, I think it may have been the 16th of July. I can't remember off the top of my head. If you'd have forewarned me, I would have got the report up to be able to go through it in more detail. Um, but in essence, it means that people are um, going back to work. Obviously, in Basildon, we have uh, lots of um, factories, advanced manufacturing, uh, and people are going back into those sites. So a huge well done to places like Ford's, Leonardo's, uh, Costa, New Holland, who've managed to get people back on the shop floor. Uh, and then a massive thank you as well on record to the environmental health team as well. Uh, so um, a huge thank you to those for those guys and Rachel Glover's team for what they've done. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr Chairman. That positive news, I would assume therefore it leaves our business rate collection rates in a better state compared to other authorities. Is that a fair assumption or is that just a glancing assumption from a one-off survey? Uh, I don't know if Mr. Lartman wants to come in on, on that particular point. Um, I don't have the information to be able to verify that one way or the other. I can certainly look into it. I think it's fair to say, isn't it, that the uh, business rates um, relief that went out uh, probably would have skipped a lot of those bigger businesses uh, and wouldn't necessarily have been applicable yes. uh, to, to those yeah. guys. Um, so we, it, as ever with business rates and, and council tax, it's a watching brief month on month. Yeah. Uh, as to yep. uh, where they're at at the moment. But so far, uh, it hasn't been uh, falling off the edge of a cliff uh, in terms of uh, receipts coming in, which uh, is a positive uh, news for us. We have put out around uh, £30 million pounds of rate relief to uh, those businesses that are eligible uh, as well. So thank you to um, Shanna and Rob Manser as well for their help uh, with that. Councillor Smith, does that conclude? Yep, thank you. Okay, in which case I'm going to move on to agenda item 12, uh, local government uh, reform uh, verbal uh, update. Um, uh, Sarah, do, do we have someone presenting this? I can't see on my screen. Um, oh, sorry. No, I'm not sure who's presenting this. Okay. Sorry, is it, I'm not sure whether Paul Paul was Paul Berkeyshaw was going to be presenting on this. No, particularly Chairman, but happy to pick up. I think obviously, I think we just keen to update around the the white paper and we touched upon as part of the seller. Right. Yeah. So there's no you want to say on that, but um, I think that was your intention. But happy to. Okay. If necessary, but I'm sure you're happy to cover it. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I don't want to cover old ground. I don't keep people here longer than they have to. I mean. Um, the government is, as we know, uh, publishing a white paper. They are looking at, um, in essence, the way in which they may be able to um, get rid of uh, county councils and district councils uh, through unitarisation and combined authorities. Uh, but quite what that looks like, uh, we're not sure. Uh, as I said earlier on, myself and the chief executive were on a call this morning with Emran Mian, uh, the director general uh, for decentralisation and devolution at MHCLG. Um, and he was pressed about uh, what is the population limits uh, that you might be looking for uh, in terms of unitary government. And he uh, has committed uh, to potentially, uh, I mean, whether we'll be able to do it or not, I think is more a decision for a minister than an official. But he was pressed quite hard on uh, coming back on the uh, population numbers, uh, what the um, upper and lower limits will be in a matter of days rather than waiting till the autumn to get that. But um, as I say, I suspect that's more a decision for a minister than an official. So uh, we may not have that uh, as quickly as some people on the uh, call this afternoon uh, may have wanted. But I did raise with him um, the issue that in Basildon, although it's widely rumoured that 300,000 is the starting point for a unitary authority. Uh, of course, although we are uh, just under the 200,000 mark here in Basildon, uh, our business rate uh, income, as we just alluded to there from Councillor Smith, our business rate base is... Uh, in some cases, larger uh, than some unitary authorities uh, in some of these uh, smaller cities in the north. And therefore, uh, if you were to include the business rates as part of the uh, economic area and as part of the calculation, Basildon would probably be home and hosed in terms of meeting criteria for a unitary authority in terms of our size. Um, but we have to wait for the formula uh, from the government to be um, uh, put forward in that devolution white paper. So. Um, hopefully, if we get it, we will circulate that to members of this committee over the summer so that you can consider that uh, as well as part of our deliberations on local government reorganisation. Uh, I will also ensure that any uh, notes uh, from meetings um, that are held uh, on the 31st of July, providing 
uh, that there are no um, uh, no agreements for it otherwise to be withheld. I will make sure that uh, documents are circulated following the uh, meeting of leaders of Essex councils on reorganisation next week, if that is appropriate to do so uh, as well, so that people can, um, uh, can people can see exactly um, what has been discussed. Um, agenda item 13 is PWLB consultation update. I said that we would do this uh, at the last meeting. Um, the government are consulting. In fact, I'm not going to say anything. I will hand over to you, Richard, because you definitely will know more about this than I do. Uh, thank you. Um, so the, uh, this consultation was um, launched uh, in that strange world uh, pre the COVID-19 pandemic. And the original deadline for um, uh, return was the 4th of July and they've extended it to the 31st of July. Um, the uh, consultation is uh, from to Treasury and it's entitled Public Works Loan Board Future Lending Terms. Um, I'll read you a bit from the executive summary. Um, so uh, the executive summary says uh, the government has launched this consultation to work with local authorities, sector representatives and wider stakeholders to develop a target, targeted intervention to stop what they call uh, debt for yield, uh, which is uh, borrowing from the PWLB and using that to uh, lever a return by investing in uh, direct property investments or indeed um, other things that we've spoken about. Um, while protecting the crucial work that local government does on service delivery, housing and regeneration, um, there are a couple of carrots um, in the uh, consultation. Uh, the first one is the lowering of the interest rate on new loans for social housing. Uh, and then the other one is a, a promise um, to reverse or part reverse the 1% increase in um, PDLB loans that um, took place in, in last October. Um, the, the consultation document does promise a series of um, regional uh, workshops um, which we've not heard anything about. Um, uh, I, I guess um, we should be fair and suggest that uh, the pandemic has affected the Treasury's plans as much as it's affected ours. Um, so I would hope that those regional workshops still do take place um, at some point post the deadline for the uh, consultation. Um, what is being proposed is a very blunt instrument um, what they are proposing is that local authorities that um, wish to buy investment assets primarily for yield would remain free to do so, but would not be able to take out new loans from the PWLB in the year in which they bought such an asset. Um, so that's a, that's a fairly blunt instrument. Um, uh, and uh, part of our response that we're currently crafting at the moment um, is that actually there are ways in which that could be finessed and we will be uh, suggesting uh, to them ways in which they might finesse that. Um, the arguments that are being put forward for uh, putting this curb on, um, so it's not an outright, uh, the proposal is not to prevent local authorities from undertaking the types of activities that um, they've undertaken. Um, it's, it, it's an indirect way of um, managing it. Um, the arguments that are being put for, forward uh, for, uh, as in the need to uh, make changes um, are that it's a low value use of public resources, um, that the income is not reliable, um, that it puts unmanageable pressure on the PWLB, and that it potentially causes distortion of reg regional and local markets. Um, nowhere in the consultation does it actually acknowledge um, why local authorities are engaging in this type of activity. Um, and we will certainly be making sure that um, our response covers the fact that um, we are doing this to replace resources that would not otherwise be available to us. Um, the, uh, the consultation itself consists of, um, I haven't actually got it in front of me, but I think there are 18 or 19 different questions. Um, some of them are, are fairly technical. They've taken the opportunity to uh, consult on, on various other issues uh, and, and, and to get an understanding. Um, it's quite interesting to get an understanding of how local authorities um, use um, PWB borrowing. Um, there's also um, a suggestion in there that um, uh, uh, in addition to this tool, 
um, or, or, or perhaps instead of this approach, um, uh, they're asking whether or not uh, there should be targeted interventions against individual local authorities, uh, because the consultation does acknowledge um, that it is a few authorities um, that have, um, they're well publicised, they're in the press, there are a few authorities who um, have really gone into this activity in, in, in a very big way. Um, the response is due by the 31st of July, and we will make sure that we get our response to them by that date, uh, but I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, I'll open this up to uh, questions uh, from uh, members, if there are any. <clears throat> uh, no member is uh, indicating, uh, so uh, in which case, uh, thank you, uh, Richard, uh, for that uh, update uh, and uh, for ensuring that our consultation response uh, will go in uh, to that uh, PWLB uh, consultation to the Treasury. So thank you again, uh, Richard. Agenda item 14 uh, is the work programme. Uh, is there any uh, items or any... Uh, conversations that members want to, to raise. I do uh, want to just add in uh, an update, uh, as I've said, <coughs> to the September meeting on a seller, uh, so that the, uh, the details of the conversations that we have over the course of the next four or five weeks uh, can be brought back to committee. Uh, and indeed, I suggest that we add in uh, a further seller briefing for the autumn meeting as well. Uh, and that can become uh, a standing item, I think, uh, until uh, Christmas time and we know one way or the other as to what the direction of travel is uh, on the white paper. Um, any uh, member have any other uh, points uh, that they wish to raise, any matters arising on the uh, committee programme? No? Okay, well, we are asked uh, to uh, consider any doors, so can I ask members to unmute themselves uh, as we move uh, to the vote on the work programme? Councillor Smith? In favour. Councillor Brown? In favour. Councillor McGurran. In favour. Councillor Baggett. Against. <laughs> Councillor Sullivan. Against. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Buckley. Against. Okay, uh, and I'll vote in favour of endorsing a program of work where we can bring forward reports that at any point you had an opportunity there to influence and to uh, talk about what else you would have done uh, other than delay, 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 delay. Okay, thank you, uh, members. The, uh, the recommendations are, are carried and therefore the work program has been endorsed. Um, we still have three items uh, remaining uh, this evening, but we do need uh, to move into part two as they are of a commercially uh, sensitive nature. So we need to take a vote uh, on the exclusion of the public and the press and the uh, turning off of our live streams. Can I ask members to unmute themselves as we go around uh, and take a vote on the exclusion of the public and the press? I'll kick off and vote in favour. Councillor Smith. In favour. Councillor Brown. In favour. Councillor McGurran. Well, I'm always reluctant to do this, as you know, but in favour. Yeah. Councillor Baggett. Against. What? Councillor Sullivan. Against. Councillor Buckley. Against. Okay. In order to protect the council's commercial position, uh, I will ask that the uh, live streaming is now turned off uh, to the public. So I can ask Sarah to do that. Thank you to those members of the public who have uh, watched.